Welcome to the University of Maryland at College Park. I'm Ben Schneiderman, and this is User Interface Strategies 94. This is the seventh year in a row we've prepared an annual, a annual uh, five-hour uh, satellite video show about emerging topics in user interface. I'm very pleased today that I am joined by three prominent leaders of the field, Jacob Nielsen of uh, Belcor, uh, Judy Olson of University of Michigan, and Myron Kruger of Artificial Reality Corporation. Um, I'll be presenting the first hour about future uh, user interfaces, future graphical user interfaces, and then we'll go each of the speakers for an hour, and the last hour will be a panel discussion with your questions, phoned in and faxed in. Uh, during the time you'll be seeing the phone numbers and the fax numbers posted, you can send your faxes uh, during the entire program, and then we'll be discussing them and dealing with questions from the audience here in front of us and among the panel members themselves. That's always proven to be a lively session, and we hope you'll stay for that. Um, it's a pleasure to see that the topic of user interfaces continues to draw strong attention internationally. Uh, the number of journals continues to increase, and I've laid out here some of them, a few of the journals on top, the conferences, uh, particularly the Sig Chi conference uh, held this year the first time in Amsterdam internationally uh, and then a wide variety of uh, books and these are some of the key ones that I think have emerged during the past year and we'll be hearing from some of the authors of these during the next uh, few hours. Uh, from our own group uh, the last year's book of the user interface strategies book has now appeared in Japanese edition I'm pleased to say uh, and there's, of course, great interest, as I said, internationally, and uh, this uh, Japanese translation represents that. Uh, in addition, this past year, I'm very pleased that our lab, which is in its 10th year, uh, produced uh, this uh, summary of 25 papers selected out of the uh, past 10 years called Sparks of Innovation in Human-Computer Interaction. Uh, there's information about these and other books in the back of your handout package. Uh, your handout package will be a guide to the materials here, the slides that the speakers will be using is in there, additional source materials, uh, papers from each of us are included, and there's, in, there's information about getting further uh, materials, including we've arranged some discounts with publishers uh, for the attendees of this course. Uh, the future is also very bright, and there will be new journals. The ACM will start, too, in uh, January of 94. The academic journal will be called Transactions on Computer-Human Interaction, and I'm very pleased that there will be a magazine for professionals called Interactions, which will begin publication in uh, January of 94. That's, I think, an exciting development, indicating the maturation of this field, and I think indicating in a positive way uh, the emergence of the dual communities of uh, the academic research that's been uh, well in place for a dozen years or more, and the very rapidly growing uh, uh, commercial community uh, that will now have a journal or magazine to present uh, uh, the results of their work. Um, uh, my basic story over these seven years is uh, still very strongly on the side of promoting a scientific approach to uh, studying the user interface to get beyond the vague phrase of user-friendly and uh, move on to think about the study of user interface in a more scientific way, precisely specifying the users and the tasks that they perform, then predicting and measuring the time it takes to learn for a specific user accomplishing a specific task, the speed of performance on those tasks, the rate and distribution of errors, and then their retention over time, what happens when they come back a week or a month later. Also, we've come to assess subjective satisfaction in more orderly ways. The University of Maryland does license our questionnaire for user interface satisfaction, which appears in paper form in Macintosh and, and uh, PC versions, um, and that's become something of a standard for hundreds of organizations around the world. Uh, we more and more recognize the importance of accommodating individual differences and the social, organizational, and cultural context. So that's the broader perspective on the research side, but the uh, perspective on the um, development side of successful interfaces uh, is this three-pillar approach, which I've refined this year, laying the foundation of 
on academic research. And then I think we've seen quite nicely how the controlled experiments in the academic environment have emerged in the usability labs and iterative testing that Jacob Nielsen will be talking about in the next hour. Uh, the academic algorithms and prototypes uh, that have inspired researchers have now inspired practitioners and there are hundreds of user interface management systems. During the past year, our group did a detailed study of a particular class of those, a rather remarkable class called Platform Independent User Interface Builders, tools that enable a implementer to write one, piece, one set of code on one platform, such as a Sun Unix workstation, and then that code will run and produce working interfaces on say Macintosh, DOS, Windows, OS2, as well as the Sun environments. I find that a remarkable trick of engineering, and that dream of speeding up software engineering by an order of magnitude has certainly occurred within the domain of these tools. Uh, the third uh, pillar has a foundation of the theories and models of academic uh, research, which has spawned the guidelines documents produced by uh, manufacturing companies, but also individual projects are moving ahead to develop their own guidelines for the systems that they're building. Um, and I must say I'm pleased to see that these strategies have uh, been working very successfully and their acceptance is growing widely. Sure, there are certain organizations still falling behind, but I think they quickly recognize that the competitive advantage emerges by applying those three pillars. So my questions are, where are we going for the future? And uh, I have two ways of looking at this towards the hardware aspects, where I think we'll see advanced technology of parallel distributed and more reliable equipment. Uh, and the goals for the user are faster, faster displays. I'm not happy with the speed of display of images, of the, of the panning, of the zooming of those images. It takes too long. It's distracting from the users. And the demands of the users for higher resolution grow rapidly. Uh, the capacity to rapidly save, search, and animate are also vital. Network connections have this year become a remarkable issue as the internet has grown, continues to grow, and the high-speed lines to permit rapid dissemination uh, is extremely, extremely important, particularly the just uh, startling emergence of, of Mosaic as a platform uh, has uh, overloaded the net, and I think service here at the University of Maryland has deteriorated to where it was maybe 10 years ago because of the increased demand uh, by the, 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 the growing number of uh, users of the information highway. Uh, I continue to see that the directions are large high resolution displays. That will be the focus of my talks later about building visual interfaces. At home, I now have a two-page color display that's 1152 by 870, and I'd be very happy to have a second one of them uh, to put side by side to show even more information. Uh, pixel precision pointing is, is, is there uh, successfully by all of these methods and the directions people want to go now are three-dimensional pointing and pointing while sitting uh, away from the table, not having to hold on to their mouse on the desk. Uh, certainly color, multiple gray levels are becoming very much important parts as, of interfaces. Uh, and as well, the video, I think, is the next direction for the few years. The intense interest in, on, the, uh, on the use of video has become very, uh, very important. Live video, stored and forward video, and I think we'll see lots of applications. And that's where I want to take our first demos today, uh, where if we get on to uh, take a look at the screen here, we'll see Cindy Tonneson, a student uh, who's uh, connected by one of the MCI phones which were loaned to us and she participated in my fall semester cl class on virtual reality, telepresence and beyond and I wanted to ask her just to tell us a little bit about her experience in using the video phone to participate. Hi Cindy. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Sure. sure. Um, I attended some class for two months through the video phone and uh, at first we were quite engaged with the novelty of the phone. Can you please that? Mm-hmm. You're there. But once the novelty wore off, the, the phone did allow me to participate easily with the class. Um, as you can see, the, the video and audio qualities of the phone need to be improved <laughs> quite a bit before we can use them 
more easily, but they did allow me to participate much more with the class than I would have otherwise. Great. Uh, Thank you, Cindy. Uh, I think that gives you an idea of what we were doing during the class. Cindy was on my desktop uh, while there were students in front of me, as well as students remote by satellite TV and other mechanisms. But it did allow uh, her to participate more actively by waving when she wanted to ask a question and by jumping in with her conversation. Uh, so, but as you can see, we'd certainly like better uh, quality video and audio. That was done over normal telephone lines. And by providing higher quality lines, we can see even, uh, we'll have, I expect very shortly, even better quality video as shown by the AT&T product uh, of personal video phones. At 112 or 128 kilobits per second, a personal video system delivers a very high quality image one that meets or exceeds most end users' audio and image quality requirements. And because this is a Windows-based program, users have the ability to move and size the video window as they share Windows applications. Let's move video onto the toolbar and focus on the document we need to review. One of the most valuable capabilities of AT&T's personal video systems is collaborative software. In this window is a page from a document that's resident on my system. Using the NCR telegraphic software, both of us can share the screen and annotate the data in the window. There are two collaboration modes, annotation and application. In annotation mode, I can use my cursor like a pencil or marker, drawing lines and making notes on the screen like this. Fred, I think we need to change the font. In the application mode, I can actually make specific changes to the document. Tom, go ahead and change the look of the text. Okay, I think this looks better. Since it's only the window that is shared, not the whole file, it's not necessary for Tom's computer to have the software resident. Since I own the software, I can save the changes and later, using the transfer application, transfer the file to Tom's computer. You can use the telegraphics function to access and collaborate on any software running under Microsoft Windows. This includes programs that are on a local area network. Imagine the possibilities this system offers in contract negotiations, industrial design, financial reports, planning and strategy documents. Virtually any Windows-based application software can be shared and annotated. And you meet face-to-face -face to share ideas and information all from your desktop. I think we'll all become more connoisseurs of the qualities of video and of audio as we see more and more of these technologies. Uh, Judy Olson will be talking about further applications of this kind of groupware and collaborative technologies. Um, uh, some have complained about AT&T's high price for this product, but I assure you the many competitors who are coming along will uh, all collectively r lower their prices very rapidly as, uh, as these become more, more widely available. Uh, one of the alternate approaches for a lower price uh, solution uh, is a very innovative effort from Cornell University uh, running on the Macintosh called CUCME. This was developed internally for, to provide simple black and white images um, that uh, uh, lower resolution, but in, since it did not require special hardware on the Macintoshes, it was very convenient for people to use, and a low-cost uh, video uh, camera would allow you to send your images. The Oceanside, California, are you there? Yes, we are. How's our sound? Hello, Oceanside. Hello. We're turning up our volume here so we can hear you a little bit better. Could you say hello again, please? Hello. Hello. Uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, are you there? Yes, yes we are. Hello, Knoxville. Uh, London, England, are you there? Yes, we are. We're here. Hello, London. Is that Sarah? How are you? I'm fine. Great. Good. Welcome to the Global Schoolhouse. Um, let me explain very briefly what we're doing here today. We're using a network of networks called the Internet. The Internet is really the global village we've been hearing about for so many years. It's a whole bunch of networks. It includes the NSFNet, for example, which is federally funded and sponsored. The NSFNet is out there to help U.S. science and, and education. 
Acting on a vision from another employee of Cornell Information Technologies, senior technical consultant Tim Dorsey has developed what's known as CU-CME. By adding about $500 worth of hardware to a Macintosh hooked up to a computer network, users can send live video images to people with whom they're already communicating. Uh, communication technology is really only as valuable as the number of people that you can reach with it. And so having great high quality video, uh, if you have to go to a special room and arrange for the satellite hookup, um, it's not going to be accessible to very many people. Uh, having something cheap, maybe if it's a, the picture's a little fuzzy, uh, black and white, um, but if you can talk to thousands of different people with it, um, then that has a, you know, a really important role to play. Today, Dorsey and I linked up. Uh, if you want more information, the uh, internet address is on your screen here, and uh, they've been, I appreciate their help in providing that, uh, uh, that video, which I think is a nice uh, opportunity. Uh, in our lab, we simply downloaded the software straight onto the Mac. We did have an Ethernet connection already, and then we were able to bring up the images by when we found the addresses of where the, those, uh, those cameras were. We could just uh, receive them start up. We didn't have to order anything, buy anything. It was just a very nice experience to be able to try that. So I see a strong direction for video, for uh, teleconferencing, for video email, for video help. We'll see a lot of services and video resources of uh, travel guides and so on. I think will be put online uh, and, and that will become more and more common. Another direction that's emerged strongly in the last year is the personal organizers, the message pads, and I wanted to give you a little insight to a couple of them. This is the Sharp uh, Wizard 9600, uh, which comes with a reasonable keyboard. I like to use it when I travel, uh, and I come up with the screen, which uh, shows a six-month display, and I can, with my finger or with the stylus, take the monthly display, and then I can simply select today's date here, uh, and we'll get, uh, here we go, the uh, today's schedule where you can see the program and my activities for the day are on here. I use this also, the notebook facility, as a word processor where I have a set of topics under each one of these and I can select, here's an uh, article I was writing about, uh, pen-based computing from a conference earlier in the year and that turns out to be fairly convenient. Of course, there's telephone books and uh, calculators and clocks and even a sketch pad where I can uh, store and uh, show. Let's see, here we come. Um, there, just my signature or some silly drawings and just my attempts to use this for uh, describing things or capturing information. I found it to be a pleasant and well-designed um, uh, facility. Uh, during this past year, uh, the uh, Apple Newton appeared, it was a great fanfare and controversy, and uh, Glenn Reichert, the director of our computer center, has been using one for three months now, and is going to give us a little demo. Where I can show you one of the interesting user interface features, which is the handwriting recognition. The Newton attempts to recognize my handwriting which as you can see I'm not doing very well at at the moment but we've still got Newton attempts to recognize and instead of my we have use and handwriting now I can double tap on use and it will show you some other things that it thought it might be here's the scribble that I wrote my and you can see that we've got me which is close use if I've got something that's close I'll generally select the one that's close there the me and then I can simply write the letter over it that I wanted it to use, not J, a Y, please. Well, that's not improving anything. I'm going to undo that last change. There's a little undo button at the bottom. Try one more time on the Y to recognize my handwriting. Now, this is after using the Newton for approximately three months and having the Newton learn which characters I make most often. Now, in addition to the handwriting recognition, one of the things I really like about the Newton is its ability to manipulate these words on the page, to use gestures and other characteristics to be able to move this around like electronic handwriting. For example, this portion right here where it recognized a couple of characters wrong, I don't want it, I just kind of scrub it out like that, 
and it disappears in a little puff of smoke, and it's uh, no longer there. Or if I'd like to take this thing and move it, I hold the pen over it for a little bit. That allows it to be highlighted, and now I can move this word anywhere on the screen that I need it, put it into the uh, text. I'm going to take that out for a moment. You notice in this case, I have something that isn't in a nice paragraph form, and I'd like it to be. I could just tell Newton I want all of this stuff put together into one piece, and please rearrange it so that it fits on the fewest number of lines possible, and there it is. So these gestures are nice for that. Um, if I would like to insert space, make a little carrot mark like that, which didn't work. I got an I. I'll undo it. Try to put another space in there. Okay, we've got some space. So you can see I can move that around. One of the gestures that I always have trouble with, not to say that they all work perfectly, is a gesture that says break the line right here. Nope, that didn't work. Let me try again. There we go. Break the line right there. And you can see that it, it broke the line. So that gesture worked. I can say I'd like to take a new note. To do that, I make a line across. A nice gesture, a very natural gesture, and I get a uh, separate note. Uh, I'm going to throw this one away. And I don't know if you're going to get great audio on this, but it um, makes you feel very good to have something all done because it crumples it up and tosses it into a wastebasket for you. One of the nice things is how the calendar has been arranged. I need to uh, go to uh, Tampa this afternoon at 4 o'clock. I taught my class this morning. If I'm going to uh, put a new item in the calendar, I just draw it out directly onto the calendar and say uh, what I would like to have that represent. Newton user interface. And it's put into my calendar. I think Glenn is a, a, a demanding user, and he stayed with using the Newton. Uh, he reports that he's uh, satisfied with the uh, services it provides, and I think uh, we're seeing a change of heart on some of the reviews. The early reviews were negative or complaining about the Newton and some of the problems, but I think uh, we're beginning to see more positive reviews. And as new applications appear and as improvements uh, come from Apple, I think we'll find that this kind of technology uh, will become more and more appealing. Uh, from my own perspective, I'd like to see a larger display, uh, and I'm also less of an enthusiast about the handwriting recognition and want more of the direct manipulation selection facilities that should be very much more rapid. Uh, I think the preservation of ink, so-called, of written text is a good idea, uh, and I think we'll find ways to put those tools to use, and I think, very importantly, integrate them to our, the other tools that we use. Um, so my other list of hardware developments include the continuing emergence of CD-ROMs, and uh, we're seeing uh, just large numbers of people buying them and newer and more interesting products. The one I've enjoyed most is the, uh, the book Alice to Ocean, a charming story that's published as a hardcover book with beautiful photos, but also available on the Macintosh with audio and sound, and I think a very spirited uh, topic of a story of a young woman who took four camels and hiked across from uh, Alice Springs in the middle of Australia, 1,700 miles to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and it makes for a, a, just a compelling story, to me anyway. I think we're also going to see novel input devices, such as the so-called active badges, room sensors that will determine where people are located, where their devices are, and uh, we'll, we'll see, I think, novel and clever ways to explore uh, explore ways of providing rapid input. Um, the uh, focus I want to go to now is about advanced graphical user interfaces, and my argument very strongly is the visual domain is where we are powerful and we need better visual display of information. I'm not happy with the current crop of uh, window managers. I feel in some ways we're caught in the valley of 1984. The Macintosh was a real contribution in 1984. Uh, but I'm not satisfied with progress since then. I think there's great opportunities for dramatically improving the productivity of workers, reducing the window housekeeping effort, and uh, facilitating much more complex tasks. I think these uh, window managers need to be tailored to accommodate small uses and simple applications, as well as 
more ambitious users who have large displays or several displays, the current designs are not well optimized for managing complex amounts of information. The basic principle I'd like to promote is what I call coordination of multiple windows. Uh, and there are some simple coordinations that I think could be done easily, that should be uh, built into the system or should be easy for users to add. Simplest one might be synchronized scrolling where you have two windows on the screen. You simply link the scroll bars from one to the other and then as you move one scroll bar, the other one scrolls to keep up. Uh, I often need to do that to compare two documents uh, and it's a, more of a frustration and distraction if I have to go from one to the other, scroll one, come back, scroll the other, get it just right. It's very disruptive of the process of doing that kind of comparison. Hierarchical browsing is a more sophisticated version where if I had a window with a table of contents for a document and another window with the document itself, I should be able to link them so that when I click on one of the chapter titles, the document scrolls to the beginning of that chapter. And as I scroll through the document, the table of contents highlighting moves to keep up with it. Those kind of tight couplings or synchronizations I think will greatly facilitate uh, work. That's just with two, but there are more elaborate uh, kind of uh, uh, couplings and synchronizations. Direct selection, another simple principle, a somehow lightweight interface that when I'm looking at a piece of text, if I point at the word, I should be able to get a little dictionary definition popping up right next to it. Uh, or if I'm looking at a program and I select a variable name, that the data declaration appears in a window adjoining it immediately. Not to have to go to some scroll bar or some, ta uh, some uh, menu bar, select, pull down, and start a new process, but it should happen in a tenth of a second and not distract you from the task of understanding your program or following the text. Uh, Two-dimensional browsers have been the subject of our lab study during the past year, and we feel that there's a great potential for improvement. All of the ones we've seen uh, that are existent commercially could be dramatically improved. Uh, the simple idea that some follow of having an overview and then a detail view uh, is the natural thing to do, but the tight coupling between those two views is done poorly in most of the cases we examine. So we've developed a formal notation for describing these synchronizations, and we think we understand a set of guidelines for allowing that to happen. With We're talking about large images where what you see on the screen is not half of what the whole document is, but a tenth, a thousandth of what's on the screen. When you have those large ratios of the visibility ratios, then we need much more powerful and well-designed tools than exist in most systems. A pair of scroll bars are not enough to accomplish that task in any uh, convenient way. Uh, and then final notion is the simple one of saving or opening a set of windows, a window state. This is done in the rooms for windows uh, notion or the dashboard system. Uh, and uh, the, those are the right direction. Uh, we see taking that even one more step to manage much, not just sets of windows, but the roles that users play within their organization. And we've come to develop that strategy somewhat more uh, elaborately. Now, there are some other kinds of coordinations that we'll want to deal with. Uh, some simple things about the way windows open and close, the dynamics of them. So in this case, we might be looking at a a uh, computer program which has a main program, we see that text, all 60, li or 60 lines of it, and it's got three sub-procedures, so they appear when you open this program automatically. You don't have to size these and place these. Now if you select one of these procedures, it becomes the left-hand side and becomes filled on the screen, and if it had six sub-procedures, they would all automatically appear uh, you know, sized in this, uh, the, the window on the right. And so uh, those kind of automations should be either built into the systems or the user should be able to create them by programming in the user interface. Uh, another simple dynamic uh, will be uh, when we have dependent closings of windows. You're working on some form of information. You get a dialog box. You uh, get some message from that. Maybe you open the dialog box to get a detailed uh, set of options. Uh, you then go for the help screen. And so you've got quite a clutter of screens. The first problem is they overlap each other, uh, which distracts you from reading them. Second problem is to get rid of them, you've got to close, 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 and get back. That process should be far smoother and, uh, and be automated. Uh, I think those things, we, I think we understand how to do those things. It's only the, uh, 
will of the designers to go and pursue them. Uh, there are other issues that I think are more traditional design issues like dialog box design and even the contemporary popular systems could benefit from improved consistency uh, in, their, in their design and then the uh, issues of external relationship that the dialog boxes should not overlap the items they're referring to uh, but they should be close enough to be convenient uh, to them. Uh, I think also scroll bars which have been around for maybe 15 years or so could use a little bit of uh, freshening up and here are five ideas about ways that some of them have been done but I think uh, uh, there are ways to improve the scroll bars on the more popular systems having uh, selectable position markers that would let you just click and return to them such as tabs in a horizontal uh, margin uh, this allows you to go back to places. You should also be able to have a value bar which shows you uh, sections of a document that gives you cues as to where to go to or the idea of a page bar for discrete positions uh, would improve the usage there. Uh, I've suggested a number of features that could be added but the danger of course is featureitis. You add one more feature, one more feature, one more feature and before you know it the interface is complex and confusing. One way out of this is to support programming in the user interface um, which would allow the users to create their own additional facilities. We have macros in Lotus 1, 2, 3 and WordPerfect. They're very successful and I think the idea of graphical macros should be implemented more widely. Um, uh, we, our project's been called Programming in the User Interface and Richard Potter will show us the system called Triggers. Hi. I'm Richard Potter from the Human Computer Interaction Laboratory at the University of Maryland. I'd like to show you how graphical macros can let users customize their computer applications by implementing new features. Having the right feature at the right time can take a seemingly difficult task and make it almost effortless to do. In most situations, built-in features can be found in the application that fit the user's needs. For example, putting parentheses around all the negative numbers in this table would be laborious to do by hand but it's trivial to do with a built-in feature of this spreadsheet application. When such powerful built-in features match the task at hand, it is as if magic has happened. It is no wonder that software companies have felt the pressure to include more and more features into their applications. But in many situations, an appropriate feature either does not exist or cannot be found. For example, what if the person wanted to do something just a bit novel, like print out their spreadsheet with all the negative numbers circled? Even the most full-featured applications cannot have enough features to cover the needs of every user. Adding more features leads to other problems. So many features can accumulate that it becomes difficult for a user to determine whether a feature exists or not. One solution is programming in the user interface. Programming in the user interface allows users to invent their own features, features that are matched precisely to the task at hand. Programming in the user interface works by letting users combine the built-in features of applications and thus create features that are specialized to their tasks. We have created a programming in the user interface system called Triggers. Like all programming in the user interface systems, Triggers allows users to invent new features by building on the application's existing features. In this case, we use Triggers to customize the spreadsheet's oval drawing tool such that it seeks out negative numbers and draws an oval around them. Triggers automates with graphical macros Trigger simulates the actions of the user, much like keyboard macros that have been so effective in character-based user interfaces. Mouse and keyboard actions are performed as if the user did them. However, unlike previous keyboard macros, Triggers also scans the pixel representations on the Macintosh's display. This addition of pixel pattern matching to macros makes them more effective in graphical user interfaces, thus the name graphical macro. The main advantage of this graphical macro technique is that triggers can work with any application on the Apple Macintosh. Another example is to draw the suspension cables of this bridge. The built-in features of this drawing application make most of the process go rather quickly. The duplicate feature makes it trivial to space the lines out evenly. However, the next step is to shorten the tops of the lines down to the top of the support cable. None of the built-in alignment features seem to do what we want.
This is another specialized feature that can be created with triggers. By using a user-created feature to automate this task, many tedious mouse drags are averted. Graphical macros can also be used with textual applications. Here the task is to add citation labels to each bibliography entry. Triggers also allows users to apply an action to all files in a folder. For example, here we are appending the word old to every file name. Is it clear that in an ideal world, one might imagine that applications will eventually include all the features that users could need. But in practice, users' needs are so diverse that some of these needs will not be met. Systems that include programming in the user interface empower users to create some of these missing features for themselves. I think that uh, the Triggers uh, project show that it's possible to build fairly elaborate uh, programs or macros using, uh, using this tool. There's, of course, lots of room for improving Triggers and I would like to encourage that that happen more regularly in the commercial products that we get that are user interface or graphics uh, driven. Uh, our efforts in, the, in our human computer interaction lab have focused very heavily on information visualization. Uh, we feel we've uh, come to understand the importance of showing lots of information on the screen at once rather than little bits of information scattered over many, many screens. And this speeds user performance and facilitates their understanding. Uh, one of the mechanisms uh, that we've, uh, uh, we've explored over several years is called uh, tree maps. And we've applied it to browsing directories and other tasks. And now uh, we've applied it to the business decision-making process called the analytical hierarchy process. Dave Turo shows us how. We've applied our tree maps approach to the visualization of the contents of a hard disk on a computer, to basketball statistics, and to the visualization of large libraries using the Dewey Decimal System. Now we're applying the tree maps to business decision-making processes. This application, developed by visiting HCIL researcher Toshiyuki Asahi from NEC Corporation, visualizes the AHP process with a tree map. The entire decision hierarchy is contained in this rectangular screen area. The first level of the hierarchy is created by vertically slicing this rectangular region. Social, economic, and technical factors all are first level factors. Their proportions reflect the priorities established with the numeric weighting previously mentioned. Economic factors dominate with about a 42% priority. Nine additional sub-criteria are displayed when the next level is revealed. An important point of AHP is thus visualized. Large priorities on parent factors, such as economic factors here, greatly impact the priorities of their sub-factors. Areas for labor, transportation, and initial investment are thus all increased by the dominance of their parent economic factors. Note that this level was created by horizontally slicing the first level factors. The alternating slicing with each level is a property of tree maps and is used to display as much as possible on the screen. The next level switches back to vertical slicing. Finally, the four alternatives, coded by color and sliced horizontally, are revealed. This application performs the actual calculations necessary for the decision. The bar chart below the tree map displays the quantitative results on which site should be selected. In this scenario, Site A is a clear winner with an overall priority of about 0.30. Site B has a 0.26 priority and is followed by Sites D and C. These priorities will always total to 1. The tree map can display at a glance the factors that heavily influence the decision. Site A's product transportation capabilities played an important role in its eventual selection. Relative to the other sites, its priority was 0.63 for this criterion. Its absolute importance among all criteria was 0.05 or 5%. Other important factors were the skills of the labor force and the wage rates that would be paid at Site A. Site B can be seen to have strong results in business transportation, 
but not enough to tip the decision in its favor. Suppose we wish to see how a more favorable wage rate would affect Site B's overall priority. A hook tool can be used to manipulate the priorities of siblings in the tree. Selecting the border between Sites A and B under wage rate, the priorities between the two can be adjusted while not affecting their siblings' priorities. As this occurs, the overall priorities of the two sites change. Site B is seen passing Site A's priority as the other two sites remain constant. Giving labor the hook, and then economics, reinforces B's strengths and thus increases its overall priority. Restoring the original view, we can utilize another tool at our disposal, the pump tool. This tool allows the priority of any criterion to be altered, but unlike the hook, it changes the absolute priorities of all the other siblings, not just the sibling next to it. For example, pumping up working environment, and then social factors, will benefit the site that dominates these particular criteria, in this case site D, eventually affecting the overall decision. For a closer look at different areas of the tree map, the zoom tool is used. This tool is useful for allocating more space for detailed portions of the hierarchy, as well as making finer adjustments with the hook and pump tools. Note that pumping up Site C's priority on driving road to one after zooming in on the environment still is not enough to make it our overall choice. The diagram can be easily zoomed back out to once again view the complete picture. That's a, that application showed enormous amount of data and the processes that uh, Dave Turo showed you for manipulating them would have taken tens of minutes in the currently existing tools for adjusting those values. But you could visually adjust them, see the results immediately, and also see the impact it had on the, the total decision. That's changing very much the way analysts can, you, can explore the possibilities, see the sensitivity of various factors to a complex decision. Uh, that uh, design there had uh, only about 100 fields in it, but uh, we certainly can, you know, you, you can, with a tree map, you can go easily to 1,000 fields and still have a good comprehension of uh, what's going on. Uh, dealing with thousands of pieces of information is becoming our natural way of dealing things. And uh, we've explored over several years the notions of dynamic queries. Uh, I'm going to show a two-minute piece of tape from last year which goes back to the idea of dynamic queries for HomeFinder, our most successful uh, project over the last few years, which has stimulated many other imitators, and, uh, uh, and we know, you know commercial products being built according to this style. So the first thing to do is to mark where you want to work here at the University of Maryland, right about, let's say, there, the A marker. And then your spouse is going to work downtown in the executive office building right about over there as the B marker. Okay. And now each of these points of light on the display um, represent a home for sale. And if I move to the right, I can control this display um, by choosing the distance that I want to be from point A. And now it's set at 30 miles and I'm going to bring it down and you can control rapidly, incrementally, and reversibly the distance that you wish to be from point A. So let's say you decide, you see there's plenty of them, so you say you want to be, let's say, five miles from work uh, so that you could, let's say, bike to work. And now you want to be somewhere inside that range from B, so you slide down and we now can see the set. And this is, looks like we've got about 40 or 50 homes over there. If I now choose about the number of bedrooms, I really want three or four bedrooms, so I move this double box slider to be three or four. I've still got about 30 houses on the, on the display, so why don't we look at the price now, and we want to keep the price down, let's say about uh, 170,000, between 140 and 170,000. And that's given us a set of about a dozen here. Uh, we could trim a little further by uh, choosing, we can choose from houses, townhouses, or condominiums. Let's eliminate the townhouses and condominiums, so we're selecting only houses. Yellow indicates selected fields, 
and I can see now I've got about 10 of them. If I click on any one of those points, uh, if I just click here, then the bottom of the display gives me a description of that house um, in Tacoma Park, a newer middle-class neighborhood, colonial brick, and fireplace garage, etc. cetera. Uh, People who saw that uh, design immediately grasped what was going on in this real estate scenario and the capacity to easily adjust those sliders rapidly, incrementally, and reversibly and see the results in a tenth of a second is very important in getting a feeling for where there's lots of, di lots of houses, where there are a few houses. You can understand the regions of Washington that were the expensive ones or finding the low-priced houses in the expensive neighborhoods. Um, uh, people, though, who were g complained about it suggested, well, nice idea, you had a map, a real estate application, good idea. And they said, but what about other applications where there is no map? Uh, what would you do to apply the dynamic queries to the places where there are no maps? And that led us during the past summer uh, to work uh, by Chris Olberg on developing the film finder where dynamic queries were applied with a star field display, as we've come to call it, and the principles of tight coupling to preserve display invariance. The film finder allows users to explore a large film database. People usually find films by walking around in a video store, while browsing film ads in the paper, by asking friends, by using a film encyclopedia, or perhaps by using a computer program such as Microsoft Cinemania. The tool we have developed is called Film Finder. The film finder can be used to quickly locate, browse, or scan information about thousands of films. Films are presented in a star field. Each category of films has its own color, drama red, mystery blue, etc. New films are on the right, popular films on the top. With the category buttons, we can select a subset of the films. We can zoom in to a particular part of the display we're interested in. When there are few enough movies in the display, the film titles show up. We can select films of a particular length using a double box slider for range selection. For selecting alphanumeric attributes, we can use our new alpha slider widget. It consists of three parts, a textual output, an index to the slider data, and the actual slider. By letting users select from a course and a fine movement part of the slider thumb, the slider can operate over as many as 10,000 elements. The alpha slider allows us to select the films by, for example, a certain director, say Ingmar Bergman. Imagine we want to find something like a drama, action, or a mystery. The alpha sliders are updated when the categories are selected to only include those titles, actors, etc. that fall under the selected categories. While browsing, we see Sean Connery and decide we want to see a movie with him. We're only interested in his most popular and recent films, so we zoom in. The Medicine Man might be a good one. Let us select it. Oh, we realize that we already seen this one, so to find something similar, we select the director and Sean Connery in the info card. Notice how the alpha sliders are updated. And when we close the info card, the query result is updated to only include the movies directed by John McTiernan and starring Sean Connery. Output suddenly becomes input. We find The Hunt for Red October, obviously a new and popular film, so we decide we want to watch it. Our experience during the past three years has led to a new set of information-seeking principles. These begin with the dynamic queries approach to filtering information by adjusting sliders, buttons, or other widgets to form a complex query. Second is the star field display, which takes two ordinal variables from a relational database and displays the entire set of records as multicolored points of light. This enables the user not only to view, but to manipulate the entire database in one screen. The third concept is tight coupling among the components of the display. The users can adjust the parameters on the input or the output to select the information they want. They begin with an overview, zoom in on areas of interest, and then can select details on demand. The film finder is just a start. 
it needs to be expanded to include more data and more varied kinds of information. But I do believe it provides an attractive example of how these new technologies will enable us to harness the flood of information. The Film Finder project was a great adventure for us this past summer. It was implemented using Galaxy, one of the platform independent uh, builders, and therefore will run on multiple platforms. Uh, you can see ways right away, even here, people were suggesting improvements already. Could we readjust the axes to have different values on them? Uh, the smooth zooming, I think, needs to be done. You could see even with a powerful workstation, the, the zooming in was rather jerky. We've redone the algorithms and it's now somewhat smoother, but as we get the thousands and thousands of them, it will slow down. So the faster display to permit that smooth animation and zooming is extremely important. We've begun to apply it in, in other domains to find documents, to find people, and we find that it is a quite powerful and general technique that you have the large display on the screen at once and the primary selectors surrounding it close at hand. You don't have to go to another page. Everything is right there, and when you click in a tenth of a second, you see the impact that that change has. We're quite excited about the alpha slider as well. This summer also saw an experimental study with alpha slider filled with 10,000 uh, names and a study of four versions of it was done. Uh, the, both the, the, the paper on that is included in your handout package uh, as well as the general paper about the uh, film finder is, is in your notes as well. Um, we think these offer a very attractive possibilities that we think will scale up to dealing with whole libraries at a time, very large information spaces and allow you to zoom smoothly in on the information you want point at the objects you want and get those details on demand. So that will be a continuing direction for our efforts in the coming years and I hope you'll find ways to do even better than we did in applying the three principles that I described in your notes and in that little uh, demonstration. So I do see fruitful directions for new research and new products in advanced user interfaces. I think we very much can move beyond that valley of 1984. After all, it's 1994, and new conceptions in user interface are, uh, I think, are quite read ready to be applied, and I'd like to see more of that happening. But I, I want to present a vision also, not only of the technology, but of the applications directions for the computing industry. It seems to me we've had great fun for the past 40 years riding the rapids uh, of the new technology, uh, adventuring in our kayaks and canoes uh, down the white water, but I think it's time that we notice that the river has grown wider all around us uh, and that it's time to take a new perspective, which I will call a more service-oriented perspective for our industry. And this will mean a very substantial change in the way we look at the problems that we deal with. It will mean a change in the people we work with. So that, for example, while the technology companies have been rapidly making alliances with one another, IBM with Apple, with Motorola, uh, Scientific Atlanta, and Silicon Graphics, and uh, been making alliances with companies similar to themselves, I think the new direction is indicated by the recent a merger with Bell Atlantic and Time Warner that is a technology company with a service provider. And I think that is the new formula. Wouldn't it be great if we could get Apple to make an alliance with, say, the American Medical Association or Kaiser Permanente to take on seriously the issues of medical care and standardize medical record keeping? It seems to me amazing that anywhere in the world you can get your airline's reservations on the screen in 15 seconds but in your emergency room, you can't get your electrocardiogram for anything. And uh, those, uh, those limitations interfere substantially with health care while increasing the cost of health care. Current medical record keeping to me is archaic, and the medical files in most physicians' offices are little more than fire hazards. They're not easily available, uh, and when you need them somewhere else, you can't get them. So I think we could change dramatically the way medical care was handled if standardized medical records were available and that the input and maintenance of these files could be done in a coordinated way. I think this fits very well with the current issues about health care uh, reform where I understand 25% of medical cost is the paperwork involved. So we certainly could do better and provide better care. 
I think similarly we could make arguments for the restructuring of education in the age of networks, in the age of powerful computers. We need to give children on the education side the capacity to engage with each other and in teams to work on ambitious projects and construct objects of meaning to each other and to people outside the classroom. I think the idea of national service this way could also be supported. My students regularly construct projects used by public service and charitable organizations in the Washington area or create tools that are useful to faculty and others around, uh, around and students around campus. Similarly, the networks will provide remarkable capacity for adult learning, productivity, and pleasure in the coming years, access to libraries and museums, and then the commercial sides as well. That, that seems to be more likely to come into place more quickly. Um, I think there are other opportunities to support electronic mail and collaboration and connections among individuals. I think restructuring homes uh, by providing home control that's efficient and uh, it's economic uh, and providing entertainment and news services in an effective way at home uh, I think is important and very important is the two-way direction of that. I'm concerned that the, some of the current scenarios suggest the information delivery model, the information at your fingertips, when w again and again those who have provided information discover that users don't really want information, but they want the connection, the communication, and the collaboration. The information is only an intermediate step in attaining what they in general want, which is to uh, collaborate with other people. I think the opportunities for groupware and business we'll be hearing about shortly and participation through teledemocracy or what I call civil systems, putting cities, states, and uh, the federal government making facilities and services available electronically will be an important next step. And finally, my lists for services to those in need, uh, to uh, communities for elders, golden age software has long seemed like a great opportunity. Uh, and uh, I hope the sooner we get to that, uh, well, the sooner we get to it, the better it will be. Let's do it before Bill Gates turns 65. Huh? Uh, access for the handicapped, I think, is another direction that we can provide to give them services that they need. And I think uh, uh, each of these directions are just the beginnings of ideas. There are many other possibilities if we shift our focus from the idea of riding those little kayaks and canoes to thinking about the uh, ferry boats and barges. It may not be as much fun to pilot one of those, but it will be the way we bring the bountiful harvest to the rest of us. Thank you very much for your time and attention and interest in this, the end of hour one of User Interface Strategies 94. Thank you. Welcome to the second hour of User Interface Strategies 94. Joining us for this hour is Jacob Nielsen of Belcor, research scientist in the Computer Sciences Division. He's the author of many books. Uh, among them, my favorite is Hypertext and Hypermedia, which is recently out in paperback edition. Uh, and his recent book is Usability Engineering, which is the topic of his talk today. He's been a leader in this topic, and he'll be talking about his strategies for inexpensive discount usability engineering studies. Jacob? That's right. Thanks, man. Okay, so by usability engineering, I mean systematic methods for improving user interfaces. So that's really what it's about. So usability is really a set of several different parameters, and I'm really referring to the same five that Ben mentioned in his introduction. I just use a slightly different uh, words for them. So this is in this table here, um, which shows the typical improvement factors you can, you can get for usability by using systematic usability uh, methods in the development process. So the first one is ease of learning, and typically there you can, you can achieve an improvement of about a factor of two, meaning that if you do not have a usability engineering department in your company right now, I can go in 
and cut your training budget in half. So that's, that's really worth taking. Uh, for efficiency of use for experienced users who already know how to use the system, uh, the improvement is typically not quite as big, but only like 25% or so. Uh, the reason for that being that e no matter how bad the interface is, people can learn it eventually. People can learn anything, you know, and they will accommodate to it, and they will be able to type, you know, any obscure command abbreviations that you use, uh, which doesn't mean that it's a good interface, but it means that, that they will eventually learn to use it. So for the expert user, we don't get quite the same potential improvement, but still the 25% is again w very much worth taking and as a matter of fact that's typically where you in fact gain uh, the largest financial benefit because you know cutting training costs is a one-time savings whereas you know added user productivity keeps going year after year and that really um, typically makes you millions of dollars in uh, the price I've been on. Um, then there's a the question of memorability meaning um, if you return to the system after a period of absence how easy is it to get back to using it that's something that we often don't measure in our lab. The reason for that is that it's pretty difficult because w to do this, we would have to first train people in the system, uh, then send them out for vacation or something for a week or whatever, and then bring them back to measure them. And that's a little bit complicated, so we don't do that often. But my guess is that the improvement factor is a little bit between um, the learnability improvement and the uh, expert user performance improvement. So between 25 and 100% improvement you would get on that parameter. Then there's the error rate, the user error rate, and that's where we can gain really, really tremendous improvements uh, because interfaces really have these many aspects that where people totally miss the point where they go down the, the, the garden path, do something wrong, and by testing, doing user testing or otherwise analyzing the interface, we can identify those, those parts of the interface where people that are very error prone and redesign it to either prevent the errors or at least minimize the probability of, of occurrence of errors. Thus, a factor of five uh, on the table there. And the final point is the user subjective satisfaction, where again, you can also achieve a pretty good improvement of about being twice as good if you do usability engineering before releasing the product. Now, all these five improvements here uh, are ones that go directly to your own bottom line if you're, as in my company, developing software where the same people pay for the development costs that also have to pay for the user's time in using the systems. Thus, paying a little bit more maybe to develop good software really pays off because you gain the benefits from the you know, improved usability. However, if you're developing for sale in the open market, you know, shrink wrap software, you don't necessarily get that, the benefit of the increased user productivity to yourself. I mean, you may have millions of users and all of them can do it faster but so what in some sense? I mean, you don't gain any, any profit from that. You only gain profits from increased sales and decreased uh, calls to your support hotlines. And those two you know, aspects can gain more than pay for the cost of usability engineering, which is pretty cheap, especially if you do it as I recommend uh, in this talk. So um, typically we see in, in magazine reviews nowadays that about 30% of the review weight is allocated to usability uh, testing and usability uh, attributes of the software. Uh, if you compare that number, this 30% here, uh, well, this is a bad pen, with uh, the budget that it takes to, to, to increase usability, that's typically 6 to 10% in uh, projects that I studied. You can see here that we really gain a lot of bang for the buck on usability because you gain 30% of the user's perceptions of the quality of your software, or at least the reviewer's perception of the quality of your software. So that's a purchase decision there, and you gain that for maybe 6% or so of your development budget. So all the rest of your budget you spend on, on you know, the features and the performance and whatever, which are certainly important, and without that there wouldn't be a system. On the other hand, those other aspects that, that are 94% you know, of your budget only gain you 70% of the user's um, appreciation of quality. So let me show some examples of that. Um, here's a popular uh, PC magazine, PC Computing, and their front cover is uh, War of the, the Words, our usability lab, tested the best word processes. Only one came out on top. The winner will shock you. And I'm not going to reveal this, of course. You will have to buy it to be shocked. But um, the, 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 my, my point is, though, that in the cover story of a major PC magazine, you have you know, Usability Lab. Let me show you a little bit of just one illustration from their article. You can zoom in on this, this here. Uh, this pie chart it indicates how they have allocated the review weight in the review of word processes. So they have 
obviously things like document creating, integration of features, performance, formatting, layout, and a lot of other things like mail merge and whatever. And again, they, that, that's 70%, and of course you have to gain, you know, win that, but the biggest slice of the pie is usability, 30%, right? So that again shows uh, how important it is to the reviews. Another example, here from a you know, really uh, popular magazine, Consumer Reports, um, they had a story on what they compared operating systems. And the table here indicates this uh, uh, bar chart shows what they did. They compared operating systems on three different parameters. Overall ease of use, word processing for programs for that system, and file management. And again, a third of the review weight goes to overall ease of use. Uh, so again, if people are trying to decide which of these systems to buy, ease of use when they read the reviews to get, get, uh, get some advice is one of the really important parameters there. Some other examples of how usability is going to be very important. This is the annual report from, uh, from Cadence, which is the world's 10th largest software company and the number one independent software vendor for uh, workstation software. So in the um, letter to shareholders by the uh, president, uh, Joseph Costello, he writes, Overlaying all of the market changes we have already discussed is a growing customer demand for high quality and ease of use. Continuing, we're investing heavily in making Cadence software easier to learn and easier to use. So the point here is that you know, major software company in the letter to shareholders, like the most important communication from this company of what their strategic directions are, increase usability. Now this was the tenth largest software company. The largest one uh, is Microsoft. I have their annual report here. Let's just, if, can we see it? Okay, this is Ma Microsoft annual report. In the letter to shareholder from their president, uh, Bill Gates, he talks also about usability and one of the points he makes is that all of our senior executives, including me, make it a point every quarter to spend time in the field with customers to get a first-hand look at how we're doing. And that really corresponds well with one of my slogans, which is that nobody should be allowed to program any software without at least having once been out to a user. It's amazing how many people just sit there, you know, in their cubicles and program stuff and they've never seen the people who are going to be use it, using it. So this annual report from Microsoft is filled with other stories about how they do usability engineering. Again, interesting how they communicate that as a major element of their corporate strategy. Let me just show one final picture from this annual report because it's pretty uh, cute. Um, we have it here. As part of the product definition state for an upcoming program, Microsoft developers interviewed potential customers and followed them around their homes, collecting more than a thousand pieces of information that are collected in, the ro in this room for review and analysis. It has room pasted up with little notes about what their customers do in their, uh, in their everyday life. So again, this field study approach is one of the important aspects of usability, getting to know what people really do and then getting software that will accommodate those needs. Okay, so given that usability is so important and everybody, or many people at least, seem to recognize that, why is it that I talk a lot about discount usability engineering, ways of doing cheaper usability, faster usability? Well, that's because it's not enough just to do the perfect product. You have to ship it in time for people to want to buy it. So time to market is important. So we have to have very fast and efficient usability methods. Also, another aspect is that we know it's impossible to design the perfect interface. No matter how well we do, no matter how many of you know, Ben Schneiderman's talks you, you go to, you, know, you can't design the perfect user interface just based on good intentions and a lot of knowledge about interfaces. There's always, there has to be more. You have to do iterative design meaning. You know, do a usability evaluation, find out what's wrong. There will always be something wrong. I mean, in my interfaces, there's something wrong. There will always be something wrong. And then redesign it, test it again, and do that as many times as you can. Uh, obviously, again, you have to stop. At some point of time, you have to ship. Um, and in order to get many iterations in before that deadline, again, each of them has to be short and cheap so you can afford it. Uh, just again, a little bit of data from, from the research literature. Uh, Skip Bailey found that each time his people iterated, they got a 12% improvement in measured usability. Um, and he actually had his people almost blindfolded, I would say, in their experiment. Uh, there were various ways in which they didn't really use uh, completely optimized usability methodology uh, because of the constraints of the scientific experiment he wanted to do uh, to writing this paper. In four projects that I studied, we found that the uh, 
average improvement in usability per duration was 38%. So no matter whether it's one or the other number, in any case, it's a really big chunk of improvement you get in usability just by going through one more process of this, you know, design, test, redesign. So therefore you want to decrease those costs, decrease the time of doing that. And here are some numbers from some of the projects in my lab we've found on the cost of doing this iterative design. There are two aspects to the cost. It's a fixed cost of just starting up, doing the first design for testing. And then there's the variable cost for each additional iteration. So it's always more, more expensive to do the first version, and then the subsequent ones are cheaper. You can see here what I call the deluxe method, where we just do everything that people might recommend doing, which is what you would do if you're developing like a really big product, you know, expecting 20 million sales or something of a new operating system, whatever. You might do it the deluxe way. And we had a cost of about 16,500 for the startup cost, the fixed cost, and 8,000 per additional iteration. As you can see, we can really save a lot on those costs, both on the fixed cost and on the variable cost by doing various uh, disc discount methods that I'm recommending. So for example, instead of programming everything in a you know, full-fledged programming language, you can use a prototyping tool, or you might even go to just making a paper markup, which is what I call the deep discount method. So just draw something in your drawing program, print it out, and then have a human sort of play computer, you know, this is the screen, this is the screen, whatever, do things like that. Um, also, Another thing you can do to save is instead of doing the quantitative measurements, which are good for doing you know, these kind of statistics that I, I have here, you want to get the numbers for that. But very often you don't really need the numbers, and in that case you can also do, do it cheaper. Uh, finally, I'll show later some diagrams on de deciding on the optimal number of test users to run in different uh, test scenarios. And again, by cutting number of test users, you can also do much cheaper. Uh, now, we cannot reduce the cost to completely zero. I mean, there are some remaining costs that are just have to be there. I mean, you have to l learn about what you're, what you're designing before you can do the first design. So there's a, always a big fixed cost before you can do the first design. And secondly, I mean, since it's, this is all based on doing redesigns, you have to do those redesigns. You have to spend time designing. So you also have that, uh, that cost in the, in the variable cost. But anyway, part of the, a major part of the... Um, the iterative design method is to do interface evaluation. You cannot just do redesigns without knowing why you want to do the redesign. What are your, you know, the points you want to look at for improvement? So you have to do some kind of interface evaluation to assess the interface's weaknesses. Um, there are different goals for interface evaluation. And depending on which goal you have, you will do, the, do it differently. Um, the classic type of evaluation is called summative evaluation, and that's really based on getting uh, numbers that can be used to compare the usability of the, your interface with other interfaces. So a good example where that's needed are those magazine reviews. If you want to compare three word processes, you want to have numbers showing how much better is one than the others. Or in development of a single product, you want to know are your usability goals met? Is your product in fact better than the previous release or than the co competing product out there? Is it good enough to meet your requirements for quality software so that you can in fact feel comfortable shipping the system. And for doing that, you need to run a relatively large number of users to get you know, reliable data. Um, the main other type of evaluation is called formative evaluation. And that's based on understanding the interface as you're developing it so progressively and finding its good and bad parts, improving it for redesign so finding good and bad parts. Now I'm mostly talking about the bad parts. Doesn't mean that there are no good parts in your know, designs, but uh, there's, it's quite important to actually pinpoint usability problems. The specific aspects of interfaces that lead to reduced user performance or user errors or you know, dissatisfaction or whatever it might be. So find those parts of the interface and then you have a long list. You can prioritize that list and you can fix the most of your usability problems in your redesign. So having the list of usability problems is key to the notion of the iterative design. So what are the types of evaluation methods you can use to achieve these goals? Well, there are four main types here. And the classic type is empirical testing. You know, contrasting your design with the real world, with real users, see what happens. I'll talk a lot about that. Um, then there are formal and automatic, automatic methods that are based on having some kind of model of the interface and either 
having a person do an analysis of the interface using that model, or even having a computer calculate metrics about the design, like how busy are the screens, is there in fact a cancel button on every dialog box, things like that. I mean, there are some things that can be done, but mostly the current state of the, the art is that formal and automatic methods basically don't work for any kind of really you know, large-scale interface design. So they are not, I mean, it's interesting to do research on, but they're not really uh, very, very useful at the moment. And the final method is, or class of methods, the informal methods that are based on your expertise and usability, your usability knowledge. And one of the types of methods is heuristic evaluation of this type, and I'll talk about that later also. But first let me talk about user testing as the main empirical method. So as I said, it's really key to get con confronted with the real world, see what really happens as real people use your system. Um, so there are several points to, to uh, consider when doing user testing. The first really important one is use real users, use representative people of the actual individuals who will be using your system. Don't use users managers, which is a classic mistake um, because they might be the ones who are signing the contract. But we have the distinction between users and choosers. The people who are buying the software, you certainly need to accommodate them, right? But what you want to do for your testing is the actual people who will be using the system. Also, don't use your friends, you know, the guy next door or whatever. That's, again, also not a representative person. Uh, they might be humans, but they are not, you know, representative users. Okay. Uh, once you have your representative users, ask them to do real tasks, representative tasks of the kind of things people are intended to use the system for. And this means don't just say, here's a neat system, you know, try it out. Um, because the feeling of just playing around is so different from the feeling of doing real work, where in fact it's critical if you're trying to do something and you can't find the feature that does it, then you're stuck. If you're just playing around, you, know, you just try other things that Seem, seem natural to you and you don't get into that situation, that you don't get the real feeling of using the system. So that's another very key point. That's actually some of the two main points. Real users, representative users, and representative tasks. Okay, so while the users are doing those tasks, you, know, you set them a task like you know, do, the, do a, uh, a pie chart or whatever, you ask people to think aloud. So keep up a running, dial, uh, running monologue actually of what they're thinking about as they use the system. Because by doing that, you gain insight into what they think about the system, what um, their model of the system is, what, how they interpret things like the menu commands, menu options, um, other pieces of information on the screen. Um, this is not a very natural way of working. I mean, most people don't sit there speaking aloud as they use the system. Thus, they often s stop doing it after a short p period of time, and then you have to prompt them. The experimenter has to say, well, so what are you thinking now, or what do you think this error message means, or whatever, uh, things like that. Uh, but while doing that, you really have to take care not to communicate anything to the, to the test user. You don't want to give them hints on how to, to use the system, because you want them to see, to solve the problem for themselves. You want to see what happens as they struggle with the weak parts of the system. That's how you really learn about your interface when you see how users recover from, from errors. Um, so it's very important not to give help too early as you are, as people are progressing towards a, to a system. Even if they're stuck, even if they seem like desperate, you still want to try and get them to solve the problem themselves first. See what happens as they go uh, down you know, a wrong set of procedures. See how, if they're able to recover from that. Because surely in the real world, that's what people will do and they will not have an expert sitting right next to them to help them out of, of, uh, of their problems. Um, I often recommend having developers sit in on user testing to observe what happens as people are using this, their, their system because that's a very compelling experience uh, to see how people you know, misuse your beloved design. Uh, but it's also very easy though, unfortunately, in that situation for the developer to want to help the user because, I mean, it's such an according to the designer or developer, it's such a natural design. I mean, it's so obvious that you should click here in this dialog box and the user is sitting there with the mouse in the other half of the box, right? And so it's very for the developers to say, well, go ahead and, and click there. And um, of course, as soon as you do that, you may have thought you helped the user, but in fact, you ruined the experiment. So it's really important not to do that, not to help users, but let them do it themselves. Um, so I often say that one of the most important rules for user testing is shut up. 
All right. Just, you can sit there, and it's very frustrating. It's extremely aggravating to sit there and not being allowed to say anything as the users are, you know, completely misusing your, your design and not doing what any, you know, normal or reasonable person would do. In fact, they are, of course, the reasonable people, and you're the one who made the mistake. But, um, <laughs> so, but, but shut up. Um, okay, a few more things I'd just like to mention is that as you're reporting the results of user testing, uh, it's very important to keep the identity of the users uh, confidential because you don't want, I mean, it's a very frustrating experience, actually, to be a test user. The user will always feel that, that they are making mistakes. I mean, they are making mistakes, obviously. And they will think that they are stupid because they make so many mistakes in using this high-tech system. In reality, it's because we made a bad design. But the users think that it's because they are stupid. And that's just a very common experience. And you don't want people to feel embarrassed by having you know, videos of them shown all over the company cafeteria or whatever. So that's important. Keep the identity of users confidential. Uh, another thing is that when you're doing these experiments, it's very easy to be misled by the results. Like users will often tell you something like, oh, if only this uh, you know, menu option had been blinking, I would surely have noticed it if they've overlooked some important, you know, the, the command they were in fact supposed to use. Well, don't trust things like that, uh, because who knows whether they would have noticed it. The only thing you actually know, the, your true data, is they didn't notice it in your current design. Maybe getting it to blink might make them notice it. Also, it might completely mess up the design. You know. So you have to make your decisions there and not just blindly accept any suggestions you get from users, especially if you're following my advice later on in this talk and doing tests with a very small number of users, because then you know, data from each individual user uh, may well be somewhat unrepresentative, and you have to apply your usability expertise onto an interpretation of that data uh, in order to, um, um, to make an, an appropriate decision for your design. Anyway, so if you're doing user testing, a very common way of doing that is to have a usability lab that's all set up to do those tests. So I would like to show you a video of, of usability lab. So when making a decision on, on what to show, I was really in, in a great dilemma here. Because on the one hand, I could show you a really good lab with all the nice facilities. And that's, of course, very appealing to do that. On the other hand, the problem about doing that is that that might lead you to think that you can only do usability if you have one of the world's best labs, which most of you probably don't. And therefore, you might say, well, let's forget about usability. Let's forget you know, about it until two years from now when we will build this great lab. And that's certainly not the conclusion I want to get across. On the other hand, if I'd shown you like a really crummy lab with horrible equipment, you might say, well, we can certainly do better than that. But that also wouldn't be you know, a really, really uh, good, good uh, outcome. So I finally decided, well, I will show you, you know, the high road. I will show you a good lab. And then you can aspire uh, to getting some kind of facilities like that eventually. Just build them up uh, gradually. So in fact, I have a video that I got from Sun, which has one of the world's most advanced ability labs today. Roll video. Usability engineering enables development teams to obtain feedback on products throughout the development cycle before costly design decisions are made. At Sun Microsystems, creators of network computing technologies, including computer workstations, servers, computer chips, and software, Usability Engineering Center enables the evaluation of the products with real customers. The Usability Engineering Center consists of three usability labs and a comparative analysis lab at Sun Microsystems headquarters in Mountain View, California, and a fourth lab at the Colorado Springs site in Colorado. Usability labs typically consist of two main rooms, an observation or control room and a lab or usability room. The two rooms are separated by a one-way mirror so that the observers can watch the participants without intimidating them. The one-way mirror also allows the usability engineer to perform activities that would be distracting to the participants, such as taking notes and logging events and exchanging information with members of the development team. 
Usability labs are extremely beneficial in many ways. The labs allow you to configure both the environment and the product or prototype so that they can be presented in a controlled fashion to each customer without external interruptions. Usability labs enable the development team and any other interested parties to watch the test live so that the team members can directly witness any problems or successes in their product designs. The team can discuss the issues among themselves and with the usability engineer who is performing the test so that they can provide valuable input during the test without disturbing or intimidating the test participant. You know, this is the third participant that's mentioned that the current date is less obvious than the others. Well, the current date is actually the color used for the window frames and can be changed by the user. I wonder if they realize that they're connected. Megan, can you ask her how she would change the color of the current date? Usability labs help to provide the efficiency and data capture necessary to run many high-quality evaluations in a timely manner. The dedicated space enables tests to be scheduled tightly, with tests running consecutively throughout the day. The dedicated video equipment ensures that each evaluation will receive sufficient data capture for optimal analysis. For example, in each lab in the Usability Engineering Center, we have four simultaneous sources of information. Two cameras that are on motorized tracks mounted on the ceiling, one camera on a movable dolly, and a scan converter for capturing direct screen output for a clearer image. In addition, the three cameras are all tunable so that they produce clear images of the computer screen without any strobing effects. Between the three cameras and the scan converter, we can get a clear image of anything in the room. In addition, the cameras each have 16 positions that can be set before the test so that we can quickly move among camera shots that we know will be important. A quad splitter enables us to watch and record all four images at once, in addition to all four sources being recorded independently for greater data analysis capabilities. Thus, anything that occurs in the room can be examined later in greater detail. All of this equipment has been designed to be easy to use and control so that a single usability engineer can run the entire test by themselves. The equipment can be controlled from software that also eases data analysis by enabling the logging of events and when they occurred. The usability room is designed to put the participant more at ease with warmer colors and plants. When the overhead lights are turned off in the control room, the participant cannot see through the one-way mirror. In addition, acoustical wall panels and soundproofing in the walls prevents the participant from hearing the discussions in the control room. The usability lab can be configured in myriad ways, from a single product and participant to constructing individual cubes in the room for studying multiple participants working with each other via the network computer. One of the most important benefits of the usability lab is that products can be evaluated before they have been developed. Simulations of working functionality can be created in the lab, and even simulations of breakdowns can be evaluated. For instance, an error can be purposely introduced into the software so that we can examine what a person would do and what types of information sources they would need under those circumstances. Usability labs are an investment, but they more than make up for their expense through increased efficiency by saving time and money through optimizing design decisions and by developing products that meet the customer's needs. Um, you may have noticed in the credits that they didn't have a role saying user such and such. And that again goes back to my point about you want to keep the user anonymous. Um, in fact, the person playing the user here was not even a real user, but one of the usability engineers. Again, because you don't want to show you know, publicly to thousands of people uh, one of your real customers uh, having, having trouble with, with the system. Uh, just one more point that I noticed and people thought it was funny when one of the engineers uh, asked one of the other engineers to ask the user a question. Uh, there's in fact a reason for that and that is that you want to have only one person who's the experimenter be the one who communicates with the user. You don't want to confuse the user with you know, 10 different people giving them instructions or commands or asking them questions or whatever. So you only want to have a single person be the experimenter in charge of uh, running 
uh, running that, that user through the experiment. Okay, um, so that was one, uh, one lab. I conducted a study, a survey of 13 labs recently, and I have a table here that shows uh, the results from that. First, of the typical usability lab, and then the range of values across those 30 labs that were part of this, this survey. So you can see the first question was, when did this, these companies get their first lab? and the median value was 89. So in general, usability labs are fairly re recent phenomena, though some companies started already in 81, but in general, it's, it's reasonably recent to have that. Uh, most companies only have one lab, so they don't have other labs, but 38% actually have multiple labs around their company. So that again, there are different models for how to manage usability, a centralized facility or a distributed facilities. Uh, both have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the typical subject room, that's a room in which the test user uh, works, 144 square feet, total lab area, 670, number of rooms, 3, but really varying a lot from 2 to 19. So again, some, some setups have very elaborate facilities with many rooms that sometimes can, can be combined in interesting ways to do uh, group wear testing, or they can test multiple products in parallel. Again, if it's a company that develops a lot of software, that's very useful to have. Also, by the way, again, the, the size of the subject room also varies a lot. Like the biggest one was 430 square feet. Uh, again, the reason for that is often that you want to be able to do testing of a large group of users uh, in, a, in a single test. Um, so all labs have, uh, have cameras. They also all, uh, all have uh, one-way mirrors, even though it's not mentioned on this slide. Uh, at the moment, a very tiny uh, majority are not using scan converters. Only 46% do that, but I think they are dropping in price, so I think very soon that will be a very standardized feature to have. Again, the idea is that you do a direct conversion of the monitor onto a videotape as opposed to having filming it, which always loses a little bit of, of quality. Uh, staff supporting the lab, that is keeping the lab running, making sure that the test users come in on time, uh, keeping a database of potential test users and so on. Uh, Median number one, Usability engineers actually using the lab for testing, median number 12, and then the ratio of those specialists to the support staff, the median number is 10, uh, but with a very wide uh, range here from 1 to 140. I generally recommend having a reasonably generous ratio there because you can really optimize the productivity of the usability engineers if you have other people who specialize in things like maintaining the equipment, you know, calling around to get the users in on time, which is always a big pain, you know, because people always cancel at the last moment, whatever. And you don't want to have the usability engineers have to do that. You want to have people who specialize in doing that, who can sort of still be calm and, and polite to the users even the third time they cancel and so on. And I have a very nice uh, person, Sheila Borek, who does that in my lab at the moment. Uh, so when you're doing um, user testing, one of, the, one of the key points is to determine how many test users to use. And uh, together with Tom Landauer, I developed a nice mathematical formula that describes what happens as you do user testing. So it's listed here, and it may look a little bit complicated, but in fact it's not. The formula says, how many different usability problems do you find with I test users? Well, it's equal to N, where N is the total number of problems in the interface that you would theoretically find if you did infinite amount of testing, times a number that's smaller than one, because you don't find everything. That's just a fact of life. So it's times a factor that's 1 minus this number here, which is what you did not find, 1 minus lambda to the ith power, where lambda is the proportion of problems found by a single test. Now, I'll show you how this looks on a, on a, on a chart, and that will make it easier to understand. But first, let me just point out that lambda is really a key parameter here. How much do you find in a single test? And lambda varies quite a lot. You can see here from some case studies that I have data for, we found that lambda varied from 16% of the total number of problems found by a single user up to 36%. So there's a really big range there. And what I really recommend is that you try to collect data from your lab on what typical values apply for your type of software. Because again, it varies a lot whether you're testing you know, voice-based uh, uh, interfaces or graphical interfaces, complex interfaces, uh, consumer based interfaces, whatever, Lambda can vary a lot depending on the type of, of software and also other factors of the test like um, how good your, your setup is and how experienced your, your usability specialists are and so on. 
Um, but what I'll show here in the next chart is just what happens for a mean value of land, the mean across uh, six studies. And this, is, this shows uh, you know, all the problems in the interface, 100%, and then how many of them have been found as you add more and more test users. So with one test user, uh, you found a little bit more than 25% on the average. And then it goes up very dramatically from one to three test users. From three to six test users, you still gain a fair amount, and then it really flattens out. So it's up by 15 users. Uh, there's a tiny, tiny little bit up here that hasn't been found yet, but really not enough to make it worth bothering about to do any more testing. Uh, again, remember that normally we're doing user testing as part of iterative design. So that means that the system your interface that you're testing now will be changed anyway. So there's no reason to beat it to death because you'll throw it out, you'll redesign it, and uh, by, as you redesign, you will introduce new usability problems. That's just another fact of life that you think you're fixing the old problems. And maybe you are, and maybe you're not. But you're probably also introducing some new errors. Thus, instead of spending all your efforts on one single Big Bang type testing, testing it to death, you know, all the way out here on the curve, uh, better do testing in this area here, um, three to six user type uh, testing, and then redesign it, and then test again a small test that again finds most of the problems, though not everything. So what is the cost of doing user testing? Uh, again, here's some numbers from experience in our lab. And again, it could vary depending on what type of system you're testing. Again, there are two different aspects to the cost. There's the fixed cost of just setting up the test. And there's the variable cost of running each test user. And for the deluxe method, what you want to use in cases where you really want to be sure you're doing everything right, uh, it's about $8,000 for the fixed cost and $2,000 for the variable cost. And we can save a lot, as you can see, if we do discount usability testing instead, 2,600 for the fixed cost and only 400 for the variable costs. So some of the things we do to save are, instead of do, doing, doing high fidelity prototyping, we may do low fidelity prototyping. So it's not exactly the same interface we're testing. It may only be a paper mock-up, but it's so much cheaper to produce. And that cuts down on the, on the, the fixed costs. Also, we may not decide to really do quantitative testing. We may not measure exactly how many seconds it takes people to do each little step. We may only do more qualitative testing where we observe what they're doing. And we you know, subjectively, uh, as a usability specialist, we decide on what, what problems the users are having. So by doing that, you can cut the cost quite dramatically. So now, a question? OK. Uh, so now we have, uh, uh, we have a cost model. And we have a benefit model. The benefit model was the formula saying how many problems are found as we add more and more users. And we know how much it costs to have, you know, start the test and then run each additional user. If we combine those two models and we add a few more assumptions that listed in the full paper, we can get this diagram that shows the ratio between the benefits and the costs. So this is a curve that shows like at this point here, for example, we make 25 times as much as we pay. At this point, we make 100 times as much as we pay for the test. And here we have number of test users. And there are two curves for the deluxe and the discount testing. So for one user, you can see with discount testing, you're making about 50 times as much money as you're investing in the test. But if you add one more user, you're actually getting a better ratio. And even though that second user doesn't actually find as many usability problems as the first one, you're still improving your cost-benefit curve because you are depreciating the fixed costs over a larger number of test users. So the curve just goes up like that um, until it tops at around three for the uh, deluxe testing and around five for the discount testing for the uh, assumptions we have in this model. So in general, this leads to my recommendation, which is three to five test users provides you with the optimal number of, uh, with the optimal results with respect to how much do you make compared to how much do you pay. So you can see here that the curves can certainly continue, and you can do more and more testing. And in fact, it's almost impossible to lose money in usability engineering. We can continue the curve all the way out to the parking lot, and we still would make money, but just not you know, comparatively speaking as much. So the optimal ratio you get with a smaller number of, of, of tests. OK, an alternative method for, for doing interface evaluation is one that I call heuristic evaluation. Which, which is one of those informal methods that are based on inspecting the interface, having usability specialists look at the interface and list its problems. 
So it's very informal and again a very cheap method, very easy to use. In fact, you can go home and use it tomorrow, which is one of our recommendations. Do this stuff. Um, so you have a checklist of usability heuristics. That's how the, the name method got its name. So those are generally accepted things that are true about good quality interfaces. Unfortunately, they are not you know, set in stone. It's not true that, I mean, usability is just a fuzzy area. So they're only heuristics. They're not you know, very, very firm rules. Furthermore, as you're doing heuristic evaluation, in addition to the list of heuristics, you can certainly also use whatever else you might know about usability if you have read you know, some good books or, or whatever. Um, so you do this by going through the interface twice. First, to inspect the flow of the interface, and second, to in more detail inspect each interface element, like each dialog box, uh, each menu, each icon, whatever it might be. Or I mean, it doesn't need to agree with graphical interfaces. It can be voice-based interfaces also. We've used it for all kinds of interfaces, and the same general principles do apply. Uh, so inspect each element one at a time against your list, short list of heuristics. Typically, you do this in one to two hours. If you have a very big interface, obviously you can't cover it in that amount of time, but it's fairly exhausting to do. So in that case, I'd rather say, well, go and take a break, do something else, and then go and do another one to two hour session later. Um, normally, the way I recommend doing this is to have the, ins the evaluators, the people doing the heuristic evaluation, um, do it individually on their own and write up a report, a list of the usability problems they found. But of course, that's some work to write that list. So an alternative way of doing it is to have an observer, another person there, as the evaluator is going through the interface, and the observer will make notes of the evaluator's comments. So that's a different way of doing it, if you, depending on how difficult it is to get your people to write reports. Uh, okay, anyway, afterwards, once you have all these reports, you then aggregate the findings to get the final list of all or as many usability problems as you found, and uh, that will obviously be larger than any individual person's findings. I have a little uh, curve showing that in a moment. But first, let me give you an idea of what I mean by heuristics. And I have a list of 10 usability heuristics. And this is, in fact, almost a world premiere. I have shown to a few more people. But um, this is a slightly revised version of this list compared to what I've been do doing in previous talks. And I made up this revised list based on a doing a factor analysis of 249 real usability problems to find the heuristics that best explained them. So I took a long list of other people's heuristics, usability guidelines from different companies, and I said, well, how well do these rules actually explain these real problems in interfaces? And then I did you know, something called a factor analysis to bring, bring out the underlying principles. And they are, in fact, the ones listed here. So the first seven rules came out of that factor analysis as the ones that explain the most usability problems. The stability of system status. So keep users informed about what's going on give appropriate feedback, match between the system and the real world, speak the user's language, use you know, re phrases that are user-oriented, not system-oriented. So the, all these app end and whatever, you know, don't use that. Follow real-world conventions. Also, provide user freedom. Users should control the, the interface. It should not be the case that the system traps people in a state where they can't get out. I mean, you, you don't want to punish people by you know, imprisoning them in this dialog box without a cancel button, as one of the classic examples. I mean, always provide an escape route for users. It's not, I mean, you may think that they're stupid, but in fact, that's just the world. I mean, people do mis make mistakes, therefore you should allow them to backtrack. So have undo features and redo features. Um, follow consist be consistent and follow standards, both platform conventions and other standards that, that might apply. So in order to have users, just be confident that the same thing always does the same you know, result. Um, prevent errors. As I said, people will make errors. Thus, plan for it. Um, good error messages are nice to have, but it's even better if people don't get into that situation in the first place. So you can have, have warning messages confirming dialog boxes before people do, you know, especially dangerous commands, things like that. Of course, you shouldn't have just a dialog box that always comes up and says, do you really mean that, this? Because then people just automatically hit OK every time. You know, so they type command, hit OK, and then it's no, no extra safety. But if you put it up only in dangerous situations, then it will become an exception 
and people will uh, will look at it, and and thereby you can and you can also design away many other things that are error prone. Okay, base interface and recognition rather than recall. So allow people to look at the interface and have visible what things are there, what actions can be done, what are the options. Instead of having people to actively remember information, because people are pretty bad at doing that, and the computers are perfect, you know. Very rarely do they actually lose a bit, so why not have the computer remembered rather than the user? Um, flexibility and efficiency of use. So provide accelerators, ways of having the expert user do shortcuts, have ways of doing frequent operations more easily, like the user programming that Ben was talking about is an example of that flexibility. So those were sort of the top uh, seven rules, but there are some three additional rules that do not explain that many um, usability problems, but they explain important ones, so they are also important to keep in mind. Aesthetic and minimalist design, so don't overfill your interface with lots of junk, you know, lots of blinking things and extra little logos and whatever. Every Every additional thing you add to the interface is one more thing for people to worry about. What does this mean, you know? If you, want, if you scan a list of 10 items, it takes longer time than to scan a list of five items. So the less you have in your interface, the better. This is a, a really a, an important rule. Uh, help users recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. So error messages, this is one of, of Ben's old, old papers, actually, that talks about how to do this. Uh, but but it really still applies. And there are still so many bad error messages in the world. It's just incredible um, how people can do these error messages from which it's impossible to understand what's wrong. I mean, tell what's wrong. And of course, don't use error codes. That, that's sort of an obvious thing. And I think most people by now understand that. Except, you know, program has unexpectedly quit minus two or whatever. They still do it. OK. Um, and finally, help and documentation. Now, one of my main rules about help is help doesn't. Help doesn't help. I mean, it's, uh, it's an additional burden on the user to have to go to help. Thus, it's better if you don't have to have it. Also, um, don't believe in, in the peanut butter theory of user interface design. This is Clayton Lewis's old, old um, you know, motto. Uh, don't believe that you can have something ugly and then smear over a thick layer of usability or peanut butter and hide the taste of what's underneath. You know, that doesn't work. Uh, so you cannot have a bad interface and make it good by having good help. Okay, and the, at the same time, though, you can, it's still good to have help because it's just impossible to design the perfect interface where people every time can do everything they want without any you know, reference to the documentation. So you do, you, it, it is good to have it. But if you do have it, make it small. I mean, every time I see this help on help, you know, I say, this is one more thing the user has to worry about. So I make the help system easy. That's at least the minimum you can do. OK, so these are the heuristics. So as you apply those, exactly the same mathematical function actually apply, uh, applies as was true for user testing. As you add more and more people doing heuristic evaluation, you find more and more. Uh, and here's a curve. Uh, this is, again, average over a set of, of studies I've done. So you add more and more, and you can see here that, again, with one person, you find a fair amount, but not that much. And as you add two and three or four people, you really gain. It's really worthwhile doing. And it sort of flattens out. You know, After 10, it's surely not worth doing. And I normally recommend three to five, because that's the part of the curve where you're really uh, gaining the most benefits. So what is the cost of doing this? Well, again, you have fixed costs and you have variable costs. Now notice, though, that the difference between the deluxe and the discount methods are pretty, that's a pretty small difference here. And the reason for that is it's already a discount usability method. So there's not much more you can save than what I already recommend. But this is a, these are approximately the costs of doing it. One more thing I'd like to mention about heuristic evaluation is it can be done as soon as you have an interface specification. As soon as you know what the interface is going to be or have some preliminary design, you can do this. Because in contrast with user testing, heuristic evaluation does not require people to use the system to achieve a real task. It requires people to inspect the design, look at the design. And you can do that even at the stage where it's just a paper specification. There's a little, some problems with that. And one of them is that missing dialogue elements, things that should be in the interface but are not there. That's something that in user testing is very easy to, to find because you just get stuck. You know, this should be there, and it's not there, you know. 
you really find it. In heuristic evaluation, you know, just turn the page to the next screen dump, and you never really know that that thing uh, wasn't there. So my conclusion is that there are a lot of usability engineering methods that you might want to apply. We talked about some of them, like going out to see the real users. Um, iterative design, you can't do a perfect design the first time, so try again. Do prototyping, you know, have some early idea of what the design is going to be like so that you can do testing before it's too late. Do user testing, uh, thinking aloud is my favorite way of doing it, there are other ways. Do a heuristic evaluation, as I just talked about. Um, and it's really true, these methods do pay off. I mean, the cost-benefit curves I showed show that the benefits were between 50 and 100 times what you pay. And that's typical. Almost every time I do this, that's what I find. I had one failed project where we only made 20 times what we paid for it. And that was a failed, failed usability project. But in, in general, you gain so much more than you pay. So it's ridiculous not to use usability methods in uh, project development. It's just, it can be really, really cheap. And I said, you can do it very, very cheaply, and you will gain you know, a fair amount. You can do it more elaborately, and you will gain even more. You know, whether you do it one way or the other, that depends on your budgets and time schedules. But in any case, you will, I mean, you will profit. I mean, that's the basic bottom line, I guess. It's really worth doing. Uh, but thinking about it, reading about it, going to lectures about it, will not help your interface at all. Doing it, that's what will help your interface. So I said, go home tomorrow. You can do a heuristic evaluation of the design you're currently working on. It's easy to do, and that will improve it. So do it. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't know, do we have two, two minutes? Welcome to the third hour of User Interface Strategies 94. Be sure to begin faxing your questions in as the show continues. We'll be answering them during the fifth and final hour. Our presenter for this third hour is Judith Olson from the University of Michigan, where she is professor and chair in computer and information systems and also professor in the Department of Psychology. Judith? Thank you. I'm talking about groupware today. I'm particularly uh, excited about being part of the user interfaces strategies because if you think about groupware, it's a special user interface. It goes from user to interface to interface to user. And what we're really talking about are all the challenges about users and their interfaces as well as conversation between the users. Groupware also has gotten a lot of press recently. Uh, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen articles about groupware in um, Byte and PC Week. And just last Tuesday, we saw in the Wall Street Journal, that's what actually gives us our blessing in this field, uh, is an article on the front page about groupware. It is a very good, long article about how groupware has infiltrated a number of companies, especially in the form of Lotus Notes. So I recommend that article very highly. Groupware has also not only hit our uh, public perception, but it has hit our corporate pocketbooks. These are not the kinds of pieces of software you go to computer land for. It is not the $79 deal. What you have to do is get software for all the people in a group, and in particular, in order to make the case, you go to your CFO and you say, I think we need video conferencing. I think we need to connect with long distance. And he says, well, how much is that? And I start out with, well, $100,000 for the, and then, and then there's $200 an hour. And he goes, $100,000? All right, this is a significant investment. And then he says next, is it worth it? And I have to say, well, we're not quite sure yet. This is a new field, and we're not sure whether we actually have to see the other partners of our group uh, or whether we can just do it over phone. But it goes on. If you want Lotus Notes, Lotus Notes is on average, they figure out, about $400 per workstation. 
but uh, the costs grow because what you have are more people that you have to hire, which I'll talk about later. And if you want to have one of these electronic meeting rooms, unfortunately they start at the Cadillac end at about a quarter of a million dollars. Well, that's a significant investment. And your CFO will say, in a high voice this time because it is woman, what? <laughs> that, you know, show me that it works. Show me that there is productivity enhancement when we do this. So this is a new field. This is a field that we have to talk very seriously about who are the users, what do they need to do to build the entire product and the, the uh, uh, interface especially around what do these people need. What do we need to do? What are our tasks? Who are our people? And what are the important features of the technology? We are stretching what we know about user interfaces to do this. So today, to help you with this cost-benefit analysis, is it really worth it when we're investing the million dollars, the quarter of a million dollars, or whatever, I want to show you a number of groupware applications that are out there. What I'm going to do today is show you real applications. These are products. Because it turns out, in order to do evaluation of groupware, it has to work. Right? It has to fit the work you're doing, and it has to be reliable enough. You cannot do little studies of groups when they're doing things over a long period of time with software that fails or that'll do only part of the task. Uh, what we want is to look at the real products out there and what have we found so far about the various kinds of groupware. Um, so I want to show you a number of products, one right after the other. What's nice about doing one right after the other is it allows you to compare and contrast. In what way do th these two things differ and would that matter to me? I also want to then show you what the results are of laboratory studies and, and reflections on how people have felt when they have used these. So we'll first go down the list of uh, different kinds of applications and then we'll talk about the review of what we know about these so far. But we don't know enough. That will be the bottom line. And what I'd like to do is help you think about these in the future. That I want to give you a scheme so that when you go into a new situation you say, is this the technology for my group doing this kind of work? And that will be the overview that we can then go out in the future and uh, make good, good decisions about. But before I do that, we always have to have a know thy user preamble. All right, the main principle about understanding what users can and cannot do. In this case, it's what groups can and cannot do. In all the things we know about human perception and memory and motor movement and things like that are magnified not only because you have to do a lot more things in real time, but now we've got conversation. We have to have conversation with the user that is at the other end, whether it be in real time or not. So, my preamble about why do we have groups. Believe me, I've been frustrated enough with the groups I've worked with to say, why do we have to do this? Can't I just do it myself? Well, now we have groups for a number of reasons. We have groups because I don't know enough. All right, I have to collect expertise that help me in certain kinds of de development projects. Or what we have to do is get the work out in a short amount of time. So we do divide and conquer strategies. We have to coordinate what we're doing. We have to disseminate information a little bit like what we're doing today. All right, to a large number of people, we can get out a single message. And doing that in a group is, is helpful. We secure commitment. So I tell you the reasoning behind something. We have a big discussion about it. And though you don't get to decide, you certainly do see the reasons for something, and we'll go out and uh, march to those particular orders. We are indeed social beasts. And so actually a lot of the work we do together is in order to have fun. It's more fun to be with other people when we're doing our work. Otherwise, why do college students have study groups, right? The ratio of the fun to the work in that case uh, is quite high. So why do we have groups? A lot of good reasons. But what's the problem with groups? Well, there's a lot of problems. Think back on the last meeting that you had in your company or in, in the university. There's a great deal of coordination overhead. It turns out that we all spend, in white collar work, from 30 to 70 percent of our time in meetings. And it turns out in meetings, we don't really do the work, we talk about the work. And then we're supposed to go outside and actually get that particular work done. Huge amount of coordination overhead. There are multiple agendas. Right? You get uh, people talking about things, and it seems like they said OK. But it turns out in the end, they had another agenda about what they were going to get done or how a particular move was going to help them. So multiple agendas. And then personalities. There are some groups that aren't fun. 
because of the people who are in the group, all right, that there are difficulties with us. So we have reasons to have groups, problems with groups. Well, what can be done to help? As in this field, everywhere, we begin with user-centered design. What does the group, what is the group? What does the group need to do, and where are we? Beginning with user-centered design, what do groups do well, what do they not do well? We should borrow the uh, saying from surgeons, above all, do no harm. All right, that I have seen, unfortunately, a number of prototypes of group wear where it does do harm. It actually slows groups down. It gets people to stumble over a very natural sequence. So let's look carefully at real groups. What do they do well? What do they not do well? Our strengths when we're in a group, we are very good at multitasking. I can listen to you while taking notes about something else. I can um, think about uh, where we're going in the future, about a particular talk or a presentation, while then also getting feedback about where we are right now. As human beings, we're very good at multitasking. We can, because we are conversational beasts, we get to say things and then watch a reaction. In real time, we can gauge ourselves as to whether we're being received well. Whether, for example, everybody's asleep, everybody's awake. Whether I'm making eye contact and they go, meaning move on to the next topic because I get you, furthermore I like you. Or sitting there going, disagree totally, all right? Not saying that, but actually just having the face. And I know whether I should try and convince you some more. So we do a lot of back and forth uh, in real time, trying to see whether gauging ourselves, seeing whether we're understood or not. We also have individual capabilities that you will recognize are not often used in a meeting. For example, we can read faster than we can listen. And therefore, if there are things that are given to us to read, our eyes can scan very quickly, go back to what we've seen before, and moving ahead, like you would page through notes and say, well, where is she in the talk? Where are we going with all of this? You can read very quickly, though listening takes a fair amount of time. There are other cognitive capabilities, but you get the flavor here. On the downside, in a group, pacing is not always right. You wish you would give feedback sometimes to make things go faster or go slower. In a group, you don't individually have control. It's a group's control. We do not always receive the feedback we're getting, and we do not always give it. All right, that I have students who listen very well while they are looking down the entire time. I have no idea whether they are with me or not. I suspect not. Um, control. There are many meetings that we go to where the topics get out of hand. There's a topic, it's discussed, somebody has a brainstorm of another idea, and off the topics wander without ever having closure on the ones at hand. All right, so it's hard to control what actually happens in a meeting or in a group discussion, even if it's over email. There is uh, a wandering that can happen. We also recognize in a group that there's power. If there's power in the room, other people are reluctant to speak up. And so you don't get equal participation if it's appropriate. Um, there's, a, there's a big distribution of who will participate when. And of course, we get distracted. If something, somebody drops all of their books on the floor in the other part of the room, we all stop and look. Right? and then forget where we were. So we have downsides, upsides to uh, being in groups. I think the bottom line is that we don't understand enough about groups to utilize all the mental power that's in a room at the same time, or all the mental power that's in a particular group in order to capitalize on what we know about people and actually move forward. So what is the solution? Design tools that extend the limits, but do not interfere. An example of a system I have seen that does interfere is a system that makes you push a button if you want to speak next. Well, some people who are control freaks think that's a really good thing because you can't just speak out. However, we're quite good, human to human, to say when we want to speak. There's a moving forward with your body. There's going, ah, and then you speak. There's all these cues saying, I want the floor now. They move very quickly, and we do that very well as a group. All right. Only in large groups do we need uh, some kind of control where we raise hands and choose, et cetera, from one person to the other. So given that as preamble, know the user, who's in this case groups, I want to march through a number of solutions out there, things that products that people have proposed to help us in our group work. I will use as a framework uh, Bob Johansson's famous two-by-two -two table that actually illustrates 
puts things in categories that I think make a great deal of sense. We look at whether something is the same time or a different time. We look at whether the people are in the same place or not. And the most common uh, cell here, what we recognize in coordinating, is meetings. All right, that's how we do a lot of our coordination work, same time, same place. When we're not in the same time, same place, we have conference calls. When we are, this is a little harder, when we are in the same place but work at different times, a very good example of that is shift work in hospitals. You've got people who are, or the, your customers, your, the people you are caring for, stay put, but the people move. And there are handoff notes that go from one person to the next. Different time, different place, traditional technologies are mail, FedEx, and fax, all of which are getting faster. All right, so we leave all of our work to the very last minute. Um, but those are our standard coordination techniques. Well, what's wrong with these technologies? Why do we need any help at all? I've already described what's wrong with meetings. Conference calls, we hear the person's voice, but we often don't have the work in front of us. We can't actually do stuff, we just call to coordinate. Shift work handoff notes, we lose the notes. Mail, FedEx, and fax is fast, but not editable. All right, we can't actually get the work done, it's just a communication from one side to the other. So there are group work technologies in each one of these cells, and I will show you examples of these. There is, for example, same time, same place. We've got electronic meeting rooms now. We have video conferencing, shared editors. There are databases to help coordinate people, email, hypertext, and Lotus Notes. All right, and I will show you what some of these look like, and then putting them side by side, we see what some of the uh, comparisons and contrasts are. So we begin with different time, different place. Email is the most popular, most successful electronic uh, groupware that we have. There are 12 million, 15 million users on the uh, internet, and it's growing. And a good example, several years ago, when I teach my MBAs, the first day I say, they've all, however, been out in the workforce, I say, how many of you have used email before? These are not the academicians, these are the people in the business force. And about two or three hands went up three years ago. This year when I asked, all the hands went up. Right? It is out there that people are now understanding the value of coordinating without being in the same time in the same place. So electronic mail. What's the problem with electronic mail? I get 60 to 100 messages a day, and some of them in the middle of that mess say, fine, see you then. And I go, see who, when? Yes, there is a from line there, but I've lost the conversational trail to what my commitment was to and whether I had indeed agreed to do something earlier. The solution for that has been electronic conferences where you can keep conversations by topic in different bins. Simple solution having electronic conferences. Of course, we'd like to be able to link the pieces inside that. Here's an assertion, here's a pro, here's a con. We'd like to build the whole network of that. And along comes hypertext. Hypertext allows us to link those pieces, but it's traditional that when you're in the middle of hypertext, you get lost. Where am I? Where can I go? Where have I been? And to follow those paths through. Well, halfway between electronic conferences and hypertext, and actually throwing a little bit of database design in there, is Lotus Notes. Lotus Notes has no major scientific, computer scientific advance it is the usable solution to all of these things. It has a good user interface, and it has the right piece parts in there to make a usable application. And let's see what that looks like. Let me now move over to another kind of application, which is a tracking application. And what I'll show you is the Notes Sales Lead Tracking Database. Now, this is the place that we log all uh, sales leads for Notes, whether they came from a telemarketing call, from a chance meeting at a trade show, or from a cold call in the field. For each lead, we fill out a document, or really fill out a form. As you can see, this form is a little bit more structured than what we saw in the other applications. It has specific fields, status field, uh, region, account team, the name of the, the contact, their address and phone number, some initial information about where this, the lead came from, and some demographics. How many PCs do they have? Uh, how many are on, on networks? What network operating systems are they using? Um, what industry are they in, etc. So we've captured all the key information about that lead um, into this database. But we're also capturing what, is, what has happened with that lead. If I open this up, you'll see that there are 
responses to that document. Now these responses are used for a different purpose than they were in the, in the discussion database. Here they're like live status updates. If I scroll through these, Judy, who's the sales representative in San Francisco, puts in a brief comment about a well-received presentation. And she goes on with a meeting with another group. Then she mentions that Linda and she are trying to coordinate this account. Now Linda is the sales rep in Dallas, and Judy and Linda found out through this database that they were working on two different divisions of the same account. Now they're able to coordinate their efforts so that they can have one face for the customer. This is a very common um, issue in any kind of multi-site, serving a multi-site client. And Judy goes on to, to talk about other um, contacts and phone numbers and other meetings, etc. Now this database is like a live status report. If Judy's boss wants to see what's going on, um, he or she can look right here in this database. Also, as a marketing person in headquarters, I can tell you this is a very useful database to me as well because I have a view of what's going on in the field at a very detailed level, a much more detailed level than I've ever seen before. Now, having this information, we can view it in different ways as well. For instance, I might want to see how we're doing in various industries. This view shows me that information. Or I might want to look at the information by land type. Notes support several different types of lands, IBM lands, Novell, 3Com, and recently we added Banyan support. Now this view has been very useful just uh, recently because when we added Banyan support, we wanted to go back and find out which accounts we had already talked to who needed Banyan support. The fact is we might have gotten somewhere in the sales process, but uh, we certainly didn't close the sale if we didn't have a solution for them. Now we'd like to go back and reactivate those accounts. And we don't have to start over. We can um, pick up from where we left off. For instance, um, here, we've had a couple of meetings with this particular client. We can go back and remember um, who we talked to, what happened, and, then, and pick it up from there. Also, in any sales organization, and any work group for that matter, it's very common that a person, um, the person who finishes a project is not necessarily the f person who started that project. Um, if a territory gets reassigned and some time has elapsed, this database makes sure that the new person coming in on that account can pick up where the previous person left off rather than starting over again. So that was our, our uh, sales leads tracking database. We actually have several other tracking databases that we use among the Notes team. We track our software problem reports through Notes. We also, our help desk um, uses Notes as well to track all the incoming calls to make sure they get answered in a timely manner and to save the information so that if you get the question a second time, you can answer it uh, more quickly that time. Another database I'd like to show you is this presentation file. In most sales organizations, there are standard presentations that everyone uses, but people out in the field are constantly um, modifying those presentations, customizing them for a particular purpose. Now, usually they customize them and no one else knows about the customizations that they've done. And if someone else has to develop a similar presentation, they have to develop it from scratch. In this database, however, we're sharing all of our customized presentations among the field so that um, when people come up with um, their own spin on the presentation, other people can benefit from their insight. For instance, I recently gave a presentation in Chicago, and I created this presentation by copying slides from the standard presentation. I also borrowed some slides from uh, other people's presentations, and I added a few of my own to create a customized presentation. Now also, I actually gave the presentation directly from Notes, because each of these documents is actually a slide stored in Notes. So this is a very convenient way for us to share those presentations as well as to present them. So what I've shown you is just several different ways that we use Notes among the Notes team. Now even though we're dispersed around the world, we can still work as a team. We can combine structured and unstructured information, and this can be captured and shared so that uh, we can be more efficient as a team. New members who join the team can come up to speed more quickly. And since we're constantly in communication, we can make better decisions. Thanks. Good, so that's Lotus Notes, which you see has a very useful combination of conferencing and email and structured entry of data elements so that you could actually reorganize what you see on the screen by putting in certain kinds of data elements. 
There were two things that Eric said on the videotape that I wanted to underscore because it'll, it'll preview what kinds of effects Lotus Notes is having. One is the manager can watch often what's happening out in the field. All right, there's a monitoring element to this that is possible. Can be good, can be bad, but that actually happens. This data is now available for lots of people to view. Um, the second one is the fact that groups come and go. There are new people added to a team. They can actually review what's happening in a fairly sensible way. I don't want somebody coming on my team and looking at all of my email over the last year to figure out what's going on. All right. But this is a structured view as to what this group has been doing and where we are in a particular process. So the fact that it's got this record keeping of capability is actually a, a new feature that you wouldn't have in either conferencing or uh, in email. So moving on to the next cell. That was the different time, different place. I do briefly the different time, the same place. And they, um, remember the situation is in hospitals or shift work. Um, there are not many applications here. You can imagine a Lotus Notes type application being helpful to coordinate all of that. But when you're in a hospital, there's a lot of walking around. When you're on the manufacturing floor, there's a lot of walking around. And perhaps this is when we need new interfaces to a Lotus Notes that's more like the Newton or handheld uh, notebook, etc., just to be able to be accessible to the people who are, they don't need to be tethered in their particular work. So shared databases and shared notes, so you can access that. Now, this upper, there's a lot of work, same time, same place, about trying to support the meetings that we have. We have too many meetings and not using enough of the resources in the room. Lots of downsides to having people get together face to face to actually do work. There are two main kinds of electronic meeting rooms, ones that have a great deal of structure to what you do and those that are much more free form. And I want to show you examples of these. The granddaddy of them all is the Arizona laboratory. Uh, Jay Nunnemaker has a um, uh, laboratory that to me looks like the Starship Enterprise. Yes, this is an executive decision room given the wood that it is in and the fact that it is in uh, uh, the shape of the, what, a case room. We have these, an amphitheater. Up front here stands Jay or a facilitator. Next to him is somebody who is a technical facilitator that helps the group move from application to application. Now we're going to brainstorm. Now we're going to do nominal group technique. Now we're going to do stakeholder analysis, etc. It is a very controlled setting. And furthermore, you do what you are told, um, but you, and you do it anonymously. You enter your ideas and your critiques, and nobody knows who said it. Immediately that says, well, maybe I can get more information in parallel, and we don't have to worry about the power structure in the room. All right, so this is a formal meeting. This, house, this has 24 workstations. You can sometimes have up to 48 people in it, two per workstation, but it is a managed group. Uh, this is the Ford Escort version of the same room, um, not the Cadillac. Uh, it has, then there's Jay in the middle, um, doing his managing of this particular group. But as you'll see, this is quite effective. For certain kinds of tasks, certain kinds of groups, this is something that will, uh, will work well. At the other end of the spectrum is a lab we have at Michigan called the Collaboration Technology Suite. This is a uh, room, as you see, that has six people in it, six workstations. There is no techno facilitator. There is no facilitator. This is head-to-head -head work where people, small groups who know each other already, are working on a shared application. In this case, the one we use most is Aspects, which is a commercial product where everybody is in the same document at the same time. You and I can type at the same time. You cannot be in the paragraph where I am, but you can be anywhere else. And as soon as I move away from that paragraph, this is our shared work, and so you can go in there and change. You can change fonts, you can change text, you can delete. But the important thing about this is that you talk. All right. This is like a whiteboard, and we're all talking about stuff and writing things down occasionally. This is now writing down in front of you. It allows a sort of free movement between brainstorming and structuring and voting, uh, but it is up to the group, as we see in this case, a small group, to manage how they're going to work. So this is the other end of the spectrum. There are middle pieces. Uh, our laboratory was actually modeled after one developed called the Capture Lab at EDS in Ann Arbor. Marilyn Manti invented it and built it and got it to work. Uh, very successful room that the General Motors managers kept coming to use. 
they finally said this is too much travel time to use your room bring the room to us and so they tore the room down and built it in General Motors headquarters where it is used almost all the time uh, this is Bev Grau here in the picture on the left hand side this has a mixture they do use aspects like we do but they also use some more structured uh, software in there to do the brainstorming and organizing etc and they are a full service unit in that they will work with you beforehand to make sure that you have an agenda that you know what topics are able to, you are able to cover in a certain amount of time do you have the right players there and then actually help you through, through the meeting and very importantly afterwards ask how it went what would you like to have happen next time so the planning the orchestrating the reflection afterwards are big parts of what makes some of these rooms quite successful uh, this is one design of their room and here is the design back in Ann Arbor Research Laboratory um, where there were minor variations in uh, the layout of the table etc these rooms differ right in size of the groups in the access they have to what they're working on and the amount of control there is uh, and very important dimensions on what, how the work is going to get done now many of the executives that come into our laboratory into our collaboration technology suite say well this is great but as soon as I show them the next piece they say that's the revolution we are used to when we are working long distance same time different place we are used to supporting the conversation the conversation so we have audio conferences we have video conferences video conferences first of all are expensive to get going but the facility let's think about the ergonomics of the video conference in most cases it's a room maybe like this except you're the participants and on this side is a large screen and there's a camera on that box in order to get all of you in the picture right what you see is a little tiny box back here with 40 people in it right? it looks like the people are 60 feet away well when you're 60 feet away from another person we know from the field of proxemics you don't have a side conversation you don't have uh, a lot of rapid back and forth you give a presentation it's formal right? just by the perceived distance from one person to the other the other problem with video conferencing we'll get to some issues of delay in a moment but the other problem with video conferencing is we talk about the work and we don't do the work occasionally we will have an object we want to show very similar to what's happening here there's a camera above me and it's showing the objects which are my overheads and in for Ben's case he had the the uh, video phone here all right so we're sharing objects through that video medium but we're not doing anything to edit or to enter that stuff so a lot of the new work has to do with sharing the work object a piece of the videotape that you saw, saw earlier today about the AT&T system we have a shared document on the screen there is the thing that we are working on as well as the conversation so if you keep in mind that there are these two parallel tracks all right there is the conversation and the object you're working on you can look you can design more carefully what this whole interaction is going to be like let me show you some examples and they are quite different the uh, we have some facilities at Michigan that are simulating remote work where in the middle of the screen is the computer and we run aspects aspects does run long distance on the internet and then the other people you are working with are in a simulated group so that when she looks at this person to the left all right they make eye contact because there's a camera over that screen when she looks at him he sees her looking eye to eye and the other woman sees the side of her face so you have all the visual cues in, in spatial relationships furthermore there's a mic and a, a speaker on the right hand side a mic and speaker on the left hand side so gestures you make about I didn't hear you where you actually lean forward you both see and hear and this person knows that they're not you're not communicating with them all the natural cues are there this is in contrast with what you saw on the videotape this morning about having the picture on the screen uh, not necessarily eye contact and not the same kind of audio you don't have you're not simulating the group in real space uh, in a room like this so that's that's one kind a second kind is on a videotape I want to show you it's called the live board by Xerox if you will notice in most of these cases people are sitting down and doing work at this shared workspace heads down 
in a meeting, you are heads down, right? And occasionally, it's hard to get the attention of the other people you are working with. There's nobody standing up and choreographing this particular setting. What you'll see in the live board is quite different. There is a choreography. The live board can be used in the same room at the same time, right? So meeting support, and as you'll see in the videotape, at long distance. Live board from Xerox. Is that everyone? The first that, really? shared work surface to oh. dramatically improve meeting Sorry. effectiveness by providing access to today's productivity tools. Liveboard is a computer behind a whiteboard. By blending computing technology with simple, familiar tools, Liveboard delivers a powerful new medium for group work. Liveboard is also an interactive Got conferencing it. tool. Okay. By connecting live boards through simple phone lines, remote groups can share a common work surface, dramatically accelerating time-critical tasks. What our market research is telling us we need and who will be doing what. Liveboard is easy to use. All the tools you need are right there. You can highlight information with different colors to group tasks together. And with the electronic pen, assign responsibilities. And because everyone focuses on the project in a live visual Holly, form, meetings day. become more productive. Information is grasped quickly day. and decisions are shared by all. Right. Individual work on personal computers becomes group work on LiveBoard. Because it features a standard PC architecture, you can bring information to and from the shared work surface and with the snapshot feature, that information can be reviewed and annotated by the group. Okay, well, the way I look at it is that whoever gets to market first is looking at 720 million in sales. Yeah. Liveboard is interactive. But it encourages group participation. No like a flip chart, you have immediate this. access to the information you need. Still, but with Liveboard, like you can organize it for visual clarification. Like a whiteboard, information can be easily erased. But with Liveboard, you don't have to worry about losing critical information. Whatever you do, you can undo at the push of a button. So no one hesitates to revise or rework ideas. Liveboard encourages it. Let us get back to you with a detailed design. Okay, when? Say, two weeks. Now, if we use standard With LiveBoard, you can bring your standard PC applications into the meeting room, where everyone can interact with the data. Information can be entered naturally with a pen. You don't have to know how to type to contribute. With LiveBoard, solutions come easily. Okay, great. That does it. Now, let's get back to the schedule. Project management tools can be used even more effectively with LiveBoard. On a complex schedule, everyone can get a clear picture of what's needed and when. That's better. Let's get advertising up there. When appropriate, you can also type information into your documents. And when you're finished, you can print the results on any standard printer. But LiveBoard doesn't limit you to electronic information. You can bring documents from any source into the shared workspace. Just scan the document with a standard PC scanner. Ideas can then be visualized and shared freely with the group. In fact, LiveBoard is a multimedia tool that supports graphics, text, audio, and video playback. So in a race to market where every moment counts, the group has every resource it needs to make decisions. It's great. I love the design. We should update the San Jose team. By tying the entire project and all the players together, LiveBoard dramatically accelerates the business process. Well, by cutting the design time and starting the tooling process earlier, we made it work. So what's it going to be? Can you commit? Can we have the 3D model absolutely no later than this date? You got it. That's a very different application than desktop video. All right, there's an orchestration of people standing up, uh, long distance audio communication, but having a, an editable screen in front of you, very different than desktop. There's a third application I want to tell you about because it again is another very different kind of thing. 
Here's a project going on at Michigan for a collaboratory, helping scientists collaborate around the world. These people are space physicists, and all of their information comes from radar in Greenland. Well, as we can imagine, it's hard to go there, collect your data, bring your hard disk home on the airplane, uh, and then do your science by yourself. We said immediately, well, there's networking. Why can't we allow you to see your data in real time in Greenland and then converse about it? This is a very different kind of groupware. What we built was, in home offices on Next Machines, are displays of what the radar displays look like in Greenland. So they're just on your screen. But then everybody from Copenhagen to the United States, both coasts, can see the same thing at the same time and converse about it. Now, these events that they're talking about last for five days. We're not going to do video conferencing. All right, that would bankrupt the project and probably part of the NSF budget uh, in this, at the same time. So what they did is put up a chat box. So a chat box, you type in what you want to say, and then it gets broadcast in text to everyone else. And when they're on, they do the same thing. Now, this is the other end of the spectrum from video conferencing because it is slow. It, however, has a number of advantages. The campaign goes on for five days. People come and go, and if they weren't there to hear audio conversation, they just scroll back and, and hear what has been going on for the last couple of days. So like Lotus Notes, we have a history of what's been going on. And furthermore, to do this science, it's not like piloting an aircraft and being a team like that. It is a slow science, and the, what we have to do is coordinate in slow time. That's actually another key, that I will not end up advocating in groupware that more is better. Either more access or faster is better. There certainly are lots of different situations for lots of different technologies. Now, I would like to tell you what we know about all of these technologies. Those are the ones that exist. Uh, there are others as well, but they are good prototypes to show you the variety of things that are out there. So what do we know about this stuff? And how do we choose what for when? I'll begin with the different time, different place. So this is Lotus Notes and email. We already know that internet is used a great deal. Uh, email is not necessarily bad because it's slow. There are two examples I can think of that are extremely useful, that it's email and nothing else, or the fact that it's text input and nothing else. When we're doing a lot of international coordination, I have a colleague in Japan I coordinate a number of things with, and I type away you know, freely in English, and then he types back, very slowly because he is translating and he wants to say things well and accurately and it turns out that that slow interaction is good for him he can compose his thoughts then ship it off to me and i can react appropriately when i have to tell some some uh, colleagues something that may not be most pleasant and i will not like the interchange i have from their face i will send them a carefully worded email and then several hours or a day later say I think we have to talk about that and then allow them some time to react. So fast is not always better, right? The idea also in the uh, Greenland project that this chat box is just fine because there's a history to it. Also there are people, there's evidence showing that email allows more people to have access to managerial decisions because they are more likely to say things. They don't need a body presence. There are some people who are awkward in body and in speech, and yet they have access um, through email. Um, uh, one of my very favorite cartoons is an internet cartoon. There are two dogs sitting at the terminal, one with a paw on the keyboard, and the other one sitting on the floor. And the, the dog, the dog with, the, with the keyboard says, what I really like about internet is they don't know you're a dog. <laughs> All right, so there's access, much wider access. Um, let me tell you about electronic meeting rooms. Uh, so this is like the Jay Nunnemaker room, uh, Team Focus, a number of other products. Structured dis decision support. Originally, all of the data were taken by opinions of the people in the room. And we should know, and we'd be very careful about that, people's opinions do not necessarily correlate with the quality of their work. In fact, there are a number of cases where they are negatively correlated. But people have followed up with structured uh, comparisons of different kinds of meetings in these kinds of rooms, and they found for structured decision support, people do come out with better decisions. It takes them slightly more time, 
and they feel not quite so satisfied with it, but I suspect that's because they haven't done this very often. They're not quite sure how that worked or whether they had the control they used to. So structured uh, decision support has been quite successful, shown to be quite successful. Free-formed group editing, more like using aspects and having uh, a tight set of people doing work uh, all at the same time. We did a large study of groups that know each other, do lots of kinds of work together, come into the room. We had 38 groups, 19 who used aspects and 19 that used whiteboard, paper, and pencil. And there was significantly higher quality of the output for those that were using aspects. All right, so there's a significant advantage to having this group shared space to actually get your work done. We thought it would have to do with brainstorming, more access, more ideas. But it turned out not. There were fewer ideas, but better ideas. Better because they built on each other. You're all sharing this design as it emerges. More done in the same amount of time. Uh, very important that you're building on others' ideas. Now, the long distance work. There are two parts to that, remember. There is sharing the work object and then um, sharing the conversation, right? both channels. We've shown already that sharing the work object uh, increases quality. That doesn't matter whether you're face-to-face -face or long distance. That's a very important statement I just said. Sharing the work object, it doesn't matter in real time, it does not matter if you're face-to-face -face or long distance, as long as you have a good communication channel. And what do I mean by that? Um, in our setup, remember there was aspects on the screen in front of us, and then this simulated group so there's a video and video and audio and audio, and it looks like a group. When you're in that situation, the quality of the work, and again, this is a large number of groups we're comparing, the quality of the work is as high as face-to-face. -face. As soon as you turn off the video, all right, everything else is the same, you lose. All right, there's a significant drop in the quality of the work. I'm not saying anything about what the, um, the process you use or anything. You do not compensate, however. As soon as the video is gone, the desktop video, then you lose the quality. Now, uh, let me just add here briefly on this. The live board, there ha this is a brand new product, and there have been no studies on it yet. We don't know how it works, especially how to orchestrate yourself. But <clears throat> let me get back to this conversation. Very important dimensions here that we're talking about. When we have a chat box, that will fit only if we're having a slow conversation. Things just sort of happen, and it doesn't matter that you have high interactivity or not. Audio conferencing, video conferencing. We have shown that video conferencing is better than audio only. It's just a lot easier to do your work. But there's a big caveat here, and that is delay. When you are doing things over the digital network, there's an automatic delay to it. You have to compress it, you have to digitize it, send it, and then decompress it at the other end. Most technologies now take over a second to do that. That's not the size of the pipe in between, it's just the fact that you have to digitize this and compress it. What do we know about human conversation? We know that if we're really having a conversation, I say something, you will speak while I speak, going uh-huh, uh, uh, and things like that, back channel. And as soon as I stop, you uptake. If there's more than a half second delay, we trip all over each other. It's just like a transatlantic phone call. What happens in a transatlantic phone call? Uh, uh, um, uh, okay, you, go, you go ahead. Okay. Uh, um, right? We don't have the, the easy uptake. And that's the same thing that happens in video conferencing with a delay. That's the same thing that's going to happen when you've got video on the screen. It's not an easy conversation when we've got these video phones because of the delay. We're not getting the same kind of eye contact, etc. And the real question, this is the bang for the buck question, is how good does video have to be before it is good? Right? How, how good does it have to be before it, there isn't any advantage over audio? And we don't know that yet. But the key human variable there is the half second delay. Anything longer than a half second is going to trip us up. Doesn't mean we can't use it. It just won't be the way we do in face-to-face -face conversation. So, Given all of that, that's all we know. All right, we don't know the rest of the details of, you know, should we have one at a time or equal access or how many different kinds of media do we have to have at the same time on the screen? This is a whole new field. Well, how do we actually think about it? 
I think what we have to do is go back to understanding the groups, understanding the users. There is a big cost out there for these kinds of technologies, and the benefits are not quite so certain. There is some advantage, but how much more are you going to how much more are you going to pay for a 10% increase in quality of a design? Well, that's a hard thing to estimate. But if we think about what the benefits are for your task, for your people, and then choosing the technology with the right piece parts to it, we can at least avoid the disasters. So let me briefly go through how you think about this. All right, first is understanding the task. When we get together in groups, we do it for lots of different reasons. Not just the having fun part and getting commitments, but there's different things that we do during that time. Brainstorming is very different than design. Brainstorming, you just out comes all these ideas, and you don't necessarily have to listen to the other people also brainstorming. They just out comes all these ideas. Design, on the other hand, is good ideas, but they have to build and fit on where you are already. It's a much more cumulative building type task. Presentation is one way with a little feedback. So let me give you a preview that presentation might be fine with some kind of delay, all right? but not design or brainstorming. All right, teaching depends on what kind of teaching. We have this kind of teaching, and we have teaching that's tutoring, where I look into your eyes to see whether you are understanding what I'm talking about, and you ask me questions, and we actually have a conversation. So what kind of teaching? Same thing with negotiation. When I go to my dean and want to negotiate for another $10,000 for my group, all right, that's a, that's a single issue and lots of back and forth. If I'm negotiating to find out who should take over a military base in the Philippines and how we're going to make that transition, this is not done in an hour and it's not clear I need to have eye contact. What I need is lots of slow help in trying to figure out consequences. So the task matters. The technology matters. About the object, and as you'll see in the next one, about the conversation. Who gets access to the thing that we are working on? Everybody? or not. Is real time important? If not, in things like Lotus Notes or Hypertext or email, how do I get somebody to understand where we are now in a particular topic? So how do I inform others of the changes? In conversation, interactivity, and here I underscore again, fast is not necessarily better. Right? What kind of interaction do I need? Do I need deliberate thought as opposed to swift back and forth? And then the people. Lots of things go along with characteristics of the people. Are they homogeneous? Meaning, is it a tight group that knows how to work, and so they have their own methods to working together? How well do they know each other? And are these issues contentious? A number of these will impact about how fast the interaction has to be and whether somebody has to be in control. So the big picture is this. Of course, it has lots of pieces underneath it. There's the task, the technology, the people. What's happening in this process? Well, there are three main concepts, the things you ought to look at before you make a decision about groupware. Do I have to be interactive? Do I need access? Who gets access to the data that we're talking about, the object? And do I need to have control? Those are the interoperative constructs that help us figure out whether this stuff is going to be better or not. And let me remind you that people like things that are not good for them. That perception does not always correlate with quality. <coughs> we have to learn a lot about what our behavior is that's better. And uh, sometimes just because it's new, it may not feel quite as good. So there are some things to think about about the future, about how to decide about information technology for groups. I would like to end as Jacob did with a just do it. Uh, but it's just do it and be careful. These things are very expensive. And in thinking about what your group is, what kind of interaction you need, what the task is at hand, and how you want to move through it. Do the whole group task scenario. What do I need when I'm face to face? What do I need when I'm not face to face? And to integrate all of that, those are the new challenges for user interface design for groups. Thank you.
Welcome to the fourth hour of User Interface Strategies 1994. Please continue to fax your questions in to us. I've already gotten a handful, and uh, it'll be easier to get through during the next hour than in the final hour when we have our panel discussion. Um, with uh, joining us on the fourth hour is Myron Kruger of Artificial Reality uh, Corporation, a true pioneer and visionary. Uh, his uh, 1991 book is Artificial Reality 2, a second pass at his earlier book, first published in 1982. Uh, he is listed among, in, in Life Magazine's list of 100 most important Americans of the 20th century. Uh, and I think once you hear him, you'll understand his visionary style is really an inspiration to me, and I hope to you, too. Thank you, Myron. Thank you, Ben. Actually, the first draft of that book was uh, finished in February 1972, and it was submitted 70 times before it was published in 82. <laughs> and uh, since I think I could claim to have started the hype in virtual reality, uh, I've also taken upon myself as to be, to be the, uh, the chief uh, critic within the field to try to turn down the temperature on the hype uh, because while I think it has helped us in many ways it also is uh, setting us up for a fall when somebody all of a sudden yells the emperor has no clothes and so uh, the first thing to do in helping people sort out what virtual reality really is and, and what it could be today uh, is to, to point out that there's several classifications of virtual reality that are extant. And uh, the first of those is what's called desktop VR. And really that's just traditional three-dimensional graphics. Uh, and that's the competition. In other words, people can do three-dimensional graphics at their desktop quite, uh, quite well. And then uh, the next category is the head-mounted display, the goggles and gloves uh, that have sold a billion dollars worth of magazines and newspapers and television time in the last two years, uh, but not made too much money for the people who, who create them. And finally, there's unencumbered approaches to try to accomplish the same sort of thing, but without making the participant uh, wear all sorts of paraphernalia to help the computer. Now, Desktop VR is inevitable. In other words, there's nothing more reliable than the march of three-dimensional graphics. So you can set your watch on this one. It will happen. On the other hand, it is so good that it's uh, uh, virtual reality with go other approaches are going to have to either fit into it or rise above it. There's uh, simply no... Uh, no way that somebody can come in with something that's 10% better than sitting at a monitor. Uh, you have to have a smash or people would simply rather, rather sit down. And one of the reasons is, in addition to the inertia that everything fits in that environment, and that has adapted to the workplace at least to a degree, and that is that the monitor, uh, this is seldom remarked upon, but the monitor is the best high resolution display device we have. And so a head-mounted display doesn't even compare with it, nor does a video projector or a computer projector. And in this category, the, the thing that you're giving up is the body as a metaphor. In other words, the physical participation. You're going to get all the graphic realism through a monitor that you get through a head-mounted display, uh, but your relationship to it will not be the same. And I'll, I'll include in this category flight simulation, which is a little odd. But what I mean by that is the traditional flight simulation has a sedentary operator controlling the movement of a vehicle through a virtual world, and that vehicle is operated by handheld controls. In other words, the, there is a distance between the user and the environment. It's really not a body interface. It's not a realistic interface. Now, the wearable technology, could I have a slide, the first slide? The wearable technology is uh, this famous picture of uh, Sally Rosenthal uh, taken at NASA by Scott Fisher. And this is what uh, Jaron Lanier has called the disappearing interface. Now, could somebody explain, uh, help him out and explain where it went if he thinks it disappeared? Obviously, it leaped off the desktop and attacked the user's brain. And um, so the slide shows the, in front of each eye, there is a display. And there's a sensor on the top of the head that determines which way the user is looking. And that tells the computer what the left and right eye view should be and therefore what image to generate. So the participant can, can look around in the graphic world and see what he or she would see if they were really in that world. Now, in addition, there are earphones. And those earphones are telling the, the um, person uh, about the sounds in that virtual world. 
And this is actually quite interesting technology. So as a move, if there's a sound coming over here and I turn my head, it still cognitively appears to be over here. Now that technology actually would have a use in, uh, apart from VR, in teleconferencing or, or conference calls. So if I were talking to five people I didn't know uh, on the telephone, I could hear each of them as having a physical location in space. And that would be quite an, quite an aid in talking on the phone today. So that's a thing to keep your eye out for in VR is what else could we use it for? Because that may well be its main contribution is not to change how, uh, not that we will all do VR, but that the, it will change how we think and how we do other things because the idea of VR works even if the technology doesn't. And the last category of it is that uh, tactile and force feedback. And this is the, this, we've had 20 years of research that never happened in this, in this, uh, this area. Uh, it should have gone on and it never did. So we're sort of playing catch up. People are doing uh, the basic introductory things that they might have done at any time in the past. But even if they succeed, it's, they're not going to succeed rapidly. So uh, my, my belief is that tactile feedback is not a critical ingredient. It's not the pacing technology in VR, not for the broad bulk of the applications. There will be some applications and there'll be specific uses of tactile and force feedback, uh, but they, we don't need to wait for it. And it's good to start research, but uh, nevertheless, we have a long time before we absolutely have to have it. Uh, and it'll take decades to really perfect, especially as a portable technology. Now, the last category is the area that I have focused on myself, and that is an unencumbered approach to VR. And that, what that means is the function of the gloves and the data suit uh, was to perceive your body. That's really what it's doing. So why not perceive your, your body through some other means like a video camera? And so since 1970, I've been working on using video cameras and sensory floors and any other means I could come up with to perceive your body as you physically behaved. I always focused on the body as the interface. And this does offer a new set of interface possibilities and perhaps uh, can be applied in areas where the head-mounted display is not appropriate. Now, in addition, you have uh, other approaches to VR, which are, we might call hybrids. Uh, you're not really doing VR, but you're doing some aspect of it. And that's really an, the intelligent thing to be doing it while we're working on it. Uh, the fake space boom is like a periscope. It's really the uh, uh, 1968 technology of Ivan Sutherland done considerably better. But you, you grasp this device and you hold it to your face and you look around in the graphic world. It can have a pretty good uh, high resolution image. And then you let go and you turn to your colleagues and you can talk to them. So it has the advantage of being easy to get in, easy to get out. In addition, you have stereo glasses which can hook up to your monitor and the monitor will generate alternate left and right, right eye images and the glasses will orchestrate this so that your eye sees the appropriate, appropriate image and you see uh, 3D. Then if head tracking is hooked up and you move your head, you see motion parallax in, the th uh, in this three-dimensional scene on the screen. Now, if the task you're working on is one you're inherently outside of, uh, there's no particular reason to be immersed in it. There's a surgeon typically is working on work in front of them. They don't get in the middle of the body and turn around and, uh, and, and have blood spurting over their shoulders. This is not, it's not obvious that this is going to help them. So uh, this, for a certain set of tasks, this will be perfectly adequate. We're also starting to see over the past, so say three, four years, uh, the invention and now the, at least the offering its products of auto stereoptic displays displays which are three-dimensional without glasses. And it's one of those things that nobody was working on it because nobody was using stereo with glasses, so it didn't matter too much if you needed glasses or not, if nobody's using it. Then the next category is what's called augmented reality. And this is quite an interesting technology in its own right. Far underdone, Steve Feiner at uh, uh, Columbia and the folks at Boeing are among the only ones doing it. But what you do here is you let the real world simulate itself and then you can walk up to a jet engine, a real jet engine, and have graphic labeling appear 
superimposed on your perception of that engine and then these arrows can point to the part that you should be removing and to the nuts and bolts that you should be working on and walk you step by step through the maintenance process. Uh, and the graphics budget required here is minimal. There's absolutely no graphics required. And so it's quite simple. All the hard part is registering the images, uh, but I believe that's a solvable problem in the short term. In other words, I think it, to some degree it could have been done much better than it has so far. The final category would be telepresence. And so back to that surgeon, uh, surgeons have become a step removed from the operating on the patient. They now stick a video camera through a puncture wound in the abdomen to remove a gallbladder. And then they stick in long instruments uh, with, um, with scalpel on the end and they move the uh, one end and at the other end and the actual scalpel is moving. This is quite confusing because if I want to go down, I move my hand up. So it takes twice as long to do. The benefit for the patient is you have little puncture wounds instead of a four inch gash. So this healing time is, the healing is accelerated enormously. And so what has happened at SRI is that they have done a system where you can, uh, there's a computer transformation in the middle the surgeon does what he expects to do, and he is remotely viewing the tools, and they do what he expects them to do, but he's not directly manipulating them. Now, what can also be done then is to shrink down the scale of motion so that he can be given a dexterity which is physically impossible. And this is quite important, like in uh, up, uh, eye surgery, where 25% of the surgeons don't have the dexterity to do the job after they discover this at the end. Now, full immersion has uh, a lot of interesting aspects. Uh, if it was here, it'd be really dramatic because what it, rather than looking at data, you are immersed in an experience. You're absolutely convinced that what you're seeing is real. Uh, you are relying on your physical uh, repertoire, your understanding of the real world to interact with the graphic objects you see in that virtual world. And if you could feel them and you could walk around naturally, uh, there's no possible question that would be a, an exciting uh, approach. And because everybody understands how to use their body in the real world. And so the, um, uh, the task for virtual reality would be best suited would be those which are environmental. Uh, those in which you are fundamentally immersed in the situation. Uh, an architect designing a building or somebody doing a layout of furniture or interior decorating for a building. Uh, there are lots of uh, cases that you can that come to mind, but those are not the, those are not the, in general, those are not big budget uh, applications, although military training would certainly be one category where you want to give as faithful a physical experience uh, of what you're simulating as possible. And the fact that you can use your body and measure the environment uh, with the body, you know, as I walk around, I'm measuring with my footsteps and my eyes are a known distance from the ground. It helps me interpret what I'm seeing. On the, on the other hand, when I have this scuba gear on, uh, I'm distanced from the experience. In other words, if it's an experience I normally see without encumbrance, uh, having four pounds of, uh, of viewing hardware on my head is, is an inconvenience. And also, if I'm working with other people, this this gear distances me from my colleagues. It also changes how I look and it makes it harder for them to deal with me. And it takes time to put it on and take it off. And if I wear it for any length of time, I get uncomfortable. It's physically uncomfortable, particularly, uh, e this is even true of the newer lightweight devices that are starting to come out. And ultimately, and one final issue is that I promise that there will be some mistakes made that are going to hurt some people's eyesight. And people are physically so different in their response to uh, different kinds of stress, physical stress, ergonomic stress. Uh, ben is walking around with a bandage on his hand from typing. And uh, so we're going to have the, eye, the ocular equivalent of uh, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. So at the same time, this is just the conceptual disadvantage. The current technology, and this is what I would term, I often give a talk just titled The Emperor's New Realities. And, uh, and that is that the state of the head mount technology as it really exists is so different from one you expect that it's a shock. Uh, it, the people 
who put on a head-mounted display, who've just seen the press, are not prepared for the fact that they're legally blind in the simulated world. 95% uh, of the research done to date has been done with 2300 vision, uh, which wouldn't let you wouldn't be allowed to drive a car with that. Uh, you, matter of fact, you probably get disability. Uh, there's also a long lag between the time you turn your head and the graphic world catches up with you. There's also, uh, it purports to be an intuitive world, but you can't, the minute you go to walk, the person, and there always has to be a person there if you're a first time user, tells you, no, you can't walk. Uh, if you want to move around the environment, you point in the direction you want your eyes to fly. Now, I don't know about you, but this is not how I get around. Uh, I walk. You know, it, it, this, is, this is just an absolute denial of the virtual reality concept. And uh, this is the one of a long list of absolutely solvable technical problems that nobody's bothered to solve. In other words, people are simply not bo bothered by this. And yet, what it means is that they're not doing it. Uh, finally, the glove, which looks very suggestive and, and, and in terms of selling the field was very important, but it does, it's not a hand. In other words, it doesn't feel anything. You don't use it like a hand. Instead, you use it exactly as the functional equivalent of a wand with a button on it. You never use two fingers in the hand, almost ever. Uh, so what's happened is, as part of the general retreat from full immersion, uh, has been the fact that people are, in the overwhelming majority of the cases, using a wand with a button on it uh, instead of the glove to operate their applications. Uh, now, applications. Ultimately, as you've been told in the press, uh, VR can be used for every application. It's almost a challenge to come up with something it could not be used for. And uh, the problem is that when you hear about all the existing applications and the scientific press is as guilty of this deception as the lay press, the truth is that there are no applications. I mean, there simply is not a... And one application out there that is pulling freight in the real world that is being used on a day-to-day -day basis to do real work. Now, what that, uh, if you just substitute the word demo, then we all know what we're talking about. Uh, but the problem is that for the last eight years, we've been doing demos, which look to me very much like NASA's early demos, which were perfectly intelligent, good research at the time. But what we're doing is reinventing the wheel in every organization when they see a new technology reinvents it it's not nih it's just not yet reinvented here and so an application to me is something a person uses every day and they use it because it's the best way to do something and it's cost effective way to do it and in fact the best test of that is when you sell it to somebody else and they use it to make money that's a real good test of an application and until you're doing that I really would prefer to turn down the, uh, what is really hype there because I, I think it's going to devalue real progress when it is actually made. And so I think the, the way you can ask the question as far as where we're going now is if the technology existed uh, and it worked, in other words, if you could buy it now, would you use it if it was free? And I think if I gave you, offered anybody watching the best system in the world, it would be in the trash in a week. And so there's, uh, what we have to realize is that there's a lot of work to be done uh, before we would use it. And it will only be used for the tasks for which it is uniquely suited. So that's back to the immersive tasks. The task which not only you're surrounded by an environment, immersed in it, but also where you want to physically move around in it. But uh, wait, remember I said the thing that we can't do is we can't walk around. So what virtual reality is uniquely suited to do is exactly what it cannot do and what is not uh, being worked on with any seriousness. So that's part of a general theme of the failure to progress in the enabling technologies. Uh, so I've always taken quite an alternative approach. Can we have the first tape? Now this, in, in light of what I've said, I won't pretend is application. Uh, this is back 1985 technology. The ideas were first uh, demonstrated in 1970, uh, but this is using the body, unencumbered body, as an input device. And this is sort of an IQ test. If you don't look at this and, and have uh, practical applications leap to mind, uh, then you're flunk. 
Uh, this was done as an art form uh, starting from, from 1970 on. This exact thing was done in 1970 uh, where I faked it. I was following the person's finger, but I could teach them to draw without being able to say a word to them. Now here's a, here I'm playing with just graphic string. My fingertips are control points of spline curves. And as you notice, this is instantaneous uh, location of fingertips in, uh, in and response generated within a 30th of a second. Up to 40 fingers can be present and the, uh, the system can respond. Now, virtual reality will be inhabited by graphic creatures, which you will uh, play with. And so this was in 1981, a real-time expert system running from a knowledge representation. Now, the point that I was making then is that the technology driver uh, is not going to be any of the, quote, practical applications. It's going to be entertainment. And there simply are more people out there than there are users or programmers. And so if you come up with a tech technology that appeals to them, uh, that you're going to have much more success in the near future than if you're hoping of any of the traditional forces to develop technology for you. And there's another reason an entertainment uh, is easy to deal with, and that is that all you have to do is to get a kid to part with a quarter in an arcade, and you have satisfied all your requirements. Whereas if I come in with a really good technology to a, to a large corporation, it may imply that they have to turn their company upside down to make use of it. Now, it's not a criticism of them. That's just a fact of life. To in integrate it with their process is much more complex. Now, these are just a series of romantic experiments on how we might interact with a computer if we could use our body. And this was presented as an art form, uh, has been uh, exhibited around the world uh, for the, over the last eight years. It's been seen by a million people, and it invariably, invariably works with people in a matter of seconds. Everybody gets it, they enter, and they are behaving within a second. That is not true of any head-mounted display systems. Uh, even of the arcade games, uh, they have an explanation that goes on for, uh, for minutes. And in fact, in, in uh, W Industries arcade game, Virtuality, they don't even explain half of the controls because nobody's ever figured out how to use them. But here we're working on a completely different set of motivations for how we might be entertained. This is essentially the digital sandbox. This is somebody invited to play. And even people who would absolutely swear they have no artistic interests uh, and certainly no competence will enter into a relationship with a projection screen that contains uh, this representation of themselves and experiment and explore and explore and explore. Now, this leads to another point that in, even in head-mounted display technology, many of the ideas have come out of the arts and not out of the sciences. Uh, at NASA, Mike McGreevy and Scott Fisher both had art backgrounds. Uh, the data glove was invented by Dan Sandeen and Tom Defani at the University of Illinois under a grant from the Endowment for the Arts. 3D sound was uh, composed by Duran Begault for 15 years before he went to NASA and did it there. And so the people interested in putting the technology together uh, and tying together the senses uh, to a very significant degree were artists. Uh, and if you were to compare uh, the dollars expended on a bang for buck be uh, basis, uh, I would put the accomplishments of the artists up against the scientists any day. Uh, I just felt that the artistic approach was a more practical way to deal with uh, the goals of research because the human interface is more complex than the scientific method uh, it is appropriate for. In other words, you, scientific research operates by isolating variables and here you have a hundred variables that you have to sort of slalom your way through and find the best combination. And so in each of these cases, now this is a teleconference, two people in different places interacting in a completely novel way. And video place refers to that idea of teleconferencing. So as you see, one way to think about how this will be used is that uh, people often are concerned about the time that people spend watching television. But the fact is, and this will be just another incarnation of video games, but the fastest use of leisure time is talking to friends and family on the telephone. 
And so this, if you think about this as a way of doing things together at a distance, of uh, cementing personal relationships. Uh, if you have a small child and you're away on a business trip, you can play together, uh, engage in an activity. This is a military application. I, people uh, I always wondered what the military applications were. But there are, uh, as you can see, this is, there's a considerable variety here. Uh, this is a little bit of interactive vaudeville. We've done some uh, performance pieces, and uh, it's a little bit of surprise for somebody to see their image pushed around. And so it's quite easy to pick a fight. And then uh, they're quite surprised to see their expectations about a mirror uh, violated. And then we have a moment where it's, we permit them to retaliate. And uh, OK, can we turn off the tape? Now, advantage of this was no wires, nothing to wear. Uh, com you're completely consistent with your normal behavior. Uh, so, in fact, if you describe the requirements of the office, uh, they're not so different. In fact, most applications take place in offices. Uh, people, offices are designed for people to interact with people. And people, the characteristics of their, their work is that they switch tasks uh, repeatedly, they're working on something, they answer the phone, the boss comes up, taps them on the shoulder. Now, if they've got a data glove on and a helmet, they're going to feel pretty foolish as they turn around to look at the boss. And so the idea, these are, and these are also very conservative places, the idea that there's going to be a guy sitting in the corner of the room, pawing around in midair, uh, working in virtual reality, that man is going to be ridiculed. And because I know that, I, I used to consult for uh, Pratt and Whitney, and that was what how the people who were doing computer graphics were treated. That, that room was called the sandbox. And so, and it's also true that in terms of the office, most of the work is simply not three-dimensional. It may ultimately, I, I, I do believe that we could probably predict that in the future every application will be three-dimensional, but I don't know what that means in terms of word processing yet. Um, and so I think that we have a little bit of inertia operating, a little bit of tradition to overcome. Now, the, can I have a slide? The video desk is the practical version of the, te the playful technology that I just showed. And it operates by a ceiling-mounted camera looking down at your hands as they rest on a desktop. And the computer picks up the image of your hands, digitizes it, and superimposes it on an application. Since it's analyzed the, thing, the, the image and located the fingertips, it can allow you can use your fingertips for menuing and drawing. And there's specialized processing required to do this, but not as much as was required 10 years ago when I first uh, demonstrated it. Now, the, uh, the purists in virtual reality would say, well, that's two-dimensional, not three-dimensional. And the first thing I'd say, well, what about the possibility of a two-dimensional virtual reality? The, reality of the workplace actually is dealing with two-dimensional information. But it turns out, in fact, I can do three-dimensional input. We did it years ago in 86. We took two copies of our hardware and we allowed the computer to track uh, the, a single finger in three dimensions. And what we found was that almost instantly, within about three minutes, you're starting to get fatigued. And if you work this way for about a half hour, uh, you were getting you saw you were on the path, the full body carpal tunnel syndrome, and you were going to be crippled for life. So this is no small matter. And the idea, you know, it seems intellectually interesting to work in three dimensions, but we really don't mean it when we get down to it. And then it turns out there's this very strange thing that not only are 99% of all applications in the world two-dimensional, dealing with two-dimensional data, but 99% of all three-dimensional applications are also Oper operated by two-dimensional devices. So even if VR were to appear today uh, working perfectly, there would be years required before the, the world of applications adapted to it, whereas two-dimensional versions of virtual reality can be retrofit to, um, to existing applications. So I can use gesture input to replace a mouse one for one in an application, it's not the best way to do it, but it can be done. It's not a major uh, revamping of the application. 
Now another odd thing is that I happen to like is that, and the live board it may have been spurred by this because Xerox was aware of, had seen uh, video placed by that time, is we have applications you can operate either sitting down or standing up, which I find quite an attractive option to have. Uh, I really resent the fact that I have to sit down to work. Can I have slides? Now, this, is, this slide show, is a composite image. It's two video images superimposed. The two video cameras are in different locations aimed at two computer graphic systems. The information on the top is the data transmitted from one computer. The data on the bottom is data received by the other computer. And the hands belong to individuals in the two different locations. The time, 1970. We just happened to stumble upon this because we were transmitting data back and forth. And it was, for the purpose of our problem, it was absolutely perfect teleconferencing. There was no desire to go to the other location. And so it was so faithful to being a realistic conversation that when the image of my hand touched the image of his, he jerked, the, he jerked his hand out of the way. He didn't want to hold hands with me. So it turns out that we have redefined telecommunication. Can we have the next slide? Uh, instead of being from point A to point B, as we've always thought, next slide. Can we have the next slide? It is instead, betwe between the two locations, we have created a third place. And that place consists of the information available to both of us simultaneously. And that's what the name video place uh, refers to. It's the place created by telecommunication. And this is the origin of that idea, whether it's used in head-mounted displays, uh, cooperative work, uh, or any other application. And it turns out that it is not necessary, can we have the tape? For this to be a high bandwidth communication, because we can transmit uh, the information we're going to talk about ahead of time, or we can operate the two applications in the different locations in parallel as you do with Timbuktu. And then the image of the hands is just a video silhouette, so it can be greatly compressed and transmitted to the other location. And it will appear, that can be done over ISDN today. Not that ISDN is deployed in the United States, but it is in Britain, and British Telecom did approach us about it. Or with a little bit of effort, it could be done with uh, a voice data modem compressing both the voice and the silhouette and operate in real time. Now this, conver this simulated conversation here is two different people in different locations talking about the most mundane of information. It could be um, a lawyer and a client talking about a contract. It could be a, um, uh, an insurance company talking to a hospital about a claim. It could be a student talking to a tutor uh, in another location about their homework. It could be two engineers talking about schematics. In other words, this is not intended to compete with face-to-face -face teleconferencing. This is something which is, would be a small increment in the telephone, which is 100 telephone calls precede every face-to-face -face teleconference or every face-to-face -face meeting. And so it's fitting into the mundane world uh, and, and trying to provide value at in the world of the spreadsheet and the um, the world of the word processor, which is where 99% of all applications are actually taking place. Now, here we have a three-dimensional application shown at, shown at SIGGRAPH in 91. And what's going on here is actually a tutoring session. When people walked into SIGGRAPH, they sat down, they saw their own hands on a video desk, but they saw the hands of somebody else sitting at another desk. And right now, that person is demonstrating how to use this rather novel application. The fingertips are operating as the aperture in an extruding device. And they are creating a three-dimensional solid in a matter of seconds. I did a mouse version of this. It was absolutely hopeless. I couldn't get anything done. Uh, this was 100 fat times as fast. I showed this first in 88 and then had a few more days to work on it in, uh, in 91. But uh, we're going to be working with some people in, uh, who make stereolithography to be doing a, a three-dimensional uh, solid directly from the, uh, from the tool. But uh, what you saw a moment ago was ten fingers exhibited. That switch control from one person to the other. And what you have is the basis here for a 3D drawing tool uh, as well as a sculpture system. 
And again, there's a, a great deal of human interface work that should be done on this. Uh, and I think that, but I think you can see that it is suggestive of a new set of capabilities. The fact that we're simultaneously in, in, at this moment controlling the size and the position uh, of the aperture. And we are, our hands are steady in three dimensions because they're resting on the desktop. They're resting in the sample plane, which we can position wherever we, wherever we want in the three-dimensional volume. So it's certainly an arguable point whether you want to have true 3D input or not. But this represents uh, some very nice capabilities. And it is, uh, it was quite successful at SIGGRAPH in a matter of about three minutes. We could demonstrate this completely unexpected um, interface, application, uh, three-dimensional interface technique, telecommunication format, and in three minutes we could get people up to speed in these little applications, and I acknowledge that they're demos. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a good test of teleconferencing if I can teach somebody how to do something in another location. And this again, now here, four fingers are operating together again because it's a spline curve that's defining the aperture. There are also triangular primitives and rectangular primitives. Uh, in just a matter of a few more weeks, uh, quite a few more features could have been added, and it would have been a fully competent uh, three-dimensional paint system for sketching, not for uh, completely uh, finished work. Now, this, is, this next project was a real application. Uh, it was implemented first with a mouse, uh, this is a virtual wind tunnel. Now, many people may have heard of NASA's virtual wind tunnel. What NASA seldom points out is that I talked about this in, uh, in San Francisco at a conference called Cyberthon, and immediately afterwards, uh, Creon Levitt of NASA came up to me and asked me what I meant, and I explained to him thinking he might fund me, and three weeks later they bought the equipment to do their vir virtual wind tunnel, which is their best known research project. But there's a picture of this in Foley Van Dam, and it turns out, though, that as interesting as this may seem uh, as a input technique, uh, the big win from it comes by making it a simulation, by making what I call the minimum investment principle. The package that NASA was, had deployed at that time, not the virtual wind tunnel, but they had a flow visualization package with a command line interface, it took 15 minutes to pose a query. And whereas in this case, we can ask the question by setting up the, uh, the, the uh, what would be the hydrogen bubble wire in a, in a liquid flow um, field. And within seconds, you're seeing the computed response to the, I want the question, what would happen to the flow going through this point or through this line? And so it, the fact that it was easy to ask a question, that the answer appeared immediately, meant that I asked many, many more questions. So there was a period from 74 to 78 when I actually implemented, or 84 to 88, when I actually implemented this, where I had asked more questions about flow fields than anybody on the planet and probably everybody put together. Uh, can we turn the tape off now? Now, the teleconferencing techniques uh, were are very successful and uh, over distance, but it also raises the question, could you use it over local area networks? A lot of the big companies at least used to be big enough uh, that it would take a significant amount of time for, to go from one set of offices to another. And so people would uh, walk, spend a half hour going to see a colleague in another department. And so uh, you could, certainly want to use it over a local area network, but there's another case, and I always think of Arthur Lyman and uh, Oliver North in the Iran-Contra hearings, sitting in the same place and constantly getting, trying to get the other person to look at the same page of the, do the document they each had in their hands. This, I've, I've had this experience around conference tables uh, many times where there's a handout, we all have it, and we're trying to get everybody to look at the same page. Uh, some people say they're there, they're not. There are other people, uh, you hear the pages turning for the next five minutes. And so uh, the, that offers a new standard. If I, if I had a camera looking down at my hands, uh, everywhere on the table, around the table, anybody could reach in and their hand would appear on, uh, appear on a projection screen. And so they could point to the things that they wanted to call the attention of the group to. 
And so now you have the possibility of, of visuals being operated by anybody in a group and thereby breaking down the authoritarian nature of, uh, of most AV presentations, uh, we, in making the participants co-equal. And that off, what that suggests is a new standard for teleconferencing, and that is it really works if you choose to use it when you're together, i.e. when it's better than being there. That phrase has been picked up by other people, but I, I like it. Um, and another ca sort of neat uh, spin-off of this is the idea, what do I do if I call somebody up and they're not there? Well, I can leave the information I want to talk to them about, and I can leave a voice and gesture message. And so I can have a, uh, a contract that I'm writing with, with working at negotiating with somebody else. And I can leave a, a, a copy of the contract. And then I can have my hand and my voice. And I point and I say, look, I want you to look at this paragraph and see if you really uh, want us to commit to uh, delivering by this date. And is this paragraph of, uh, going to be a sticking point? And I wish you'd look at it because it's important to us. And then when the person comes in, it's, very, it's a very natural and familiar and comfortable thing to look at the hands uh, and the voice together. So much so that uh, w so the thing that people forget, they say, well, you could do that with a cursor. And the thing is that there's circuitry in the brain for understanding the human hand. And we can, if I see somebody's hands do something, I know how to do it. It's monkey see, monkey do. If I see a cursor do it, there's a layer of inference required to figure out what physical actions are required to accomplish, the, to make the cursor do the same thing. And so uh, the use of hands is perhaps of general utility. We did a, a CAD system back in the early 80s, not involved with VR, but we generated animated animation, an animated explanation of how do, you, how do you hold a data tablet to operate this CAD tool. And there was a natural language uh, explanation generated at the same time. Both were generated from the same knowledge base. And so even the, uh, the, the issue of how much animation was generated was abbreviated as you became familiar with the system. And I think that would be a comfortable way of, uh, of providing online help uh, in, in certain situations. Now, we're still going to need a human interface when virtual reality succeeds. There's no uh, question about that. It doesn't, simulation will not be enough, the metaphor of the body. Uh, and at the same time, I don't want to rely on the body to do the symbolic input. Uh, some people are enamored of sign language, but I assure you that sign language is not the future of the human interface. Uh, but there is a, a set of new opportunities in multipoint control. Uh, somewhere it is written that man was born with one mouse and uh, that two-handed input is unnecessary. On the other hand, if you look uh, at Ivan Sutherland's sketchpad, it's a very effective interface. And the reason is, as I pointed out to Alan Kay recently, both hands are working in concert. No recent pointing interface or GUI interface uh, uses two hands in, with, so gracefully. And so... Uh, for instance, using one hand to menu and the other hand to point within the application would cut out a lot of the inefficient mousing around that you do on the Macintosh today. Uh, there are, we do some rather strange things of using, uh, of using one hand to position a tiny copy of the other hand. And that hand can do pixel positioning. And so it's the big hand and little hand interface. But the real future, and Ben and I agree to disagree on this, uh, is to me, in virtual reality at least, that point and talk is the future of the interface because I can, uh, I want to have my body, both hands busy in virtual reality. So it is natural then to want as many parallel um, channels of communication with a computer as possible. And so it'd be very natural then to call to speak to the computer and ask the computer to, uh, to do traditional commands for me. So in, um, in summarizing here, head-mount displays won't be used in the office until they meet the following criteria. I think they're an exciting technology, so um, I sort of come back and, and switch fields again. Uh, but they, won't, they will be resisted in the office 
and in many applications until they meet the following criteria. And that is, among other things, they fit within normal eyeglasses. So, and there are no wires. They don't change your appearance. They uh, don't cut you off from your colleagues. You can still make eye contact with them. But now the graphics that they generate are displayed in the real world and are visible to your colleagues as well. So now we can sit around, stand at the water cooler and I can bring up a three-dimensional model of the combustion chamber of a jet engine and I can point, be pointing to features. You can point to them as well. There can be voice access to this. It's a problem we're both working on over a long period of time. So we already have these things prepared. And, and you may have your version and you, you bring it up. Now to the observer, this looks like a sorcerer's duel. You know, we're whipping out uh, animated uh, uh, graphics in midair. But this technology would fit so gracefully into the traditions of how we interact physically, the technology has adapted us rather than the other way around. And since it doesn't change your appearance or uh, encumber you in any way, why wouldn't you use it? Especially if it was free. Now, why would it be free? Well, it turns out that computers have always been sold by the pound. And so, in fact, a small display is inherently cheaper than a big one if we can build it. And so, it was just nobody asked, sort of, to make, could we make a small display? And so, it is just a, a matter of time as we sort of redo uh, the thinking uh, to try to build small displays, which really, there's only been initial effort in the last couple of years. Mainly, we're still taking apart Japanese consumer products. Uh, but uh, sort of like South Sea Islanders. And, uh, but when we do our own technology, and we've done some active matrix stuff, and, and as I predicted in my first book, the same technology is being used as the same fab lines that are used to make DRAMs uh, are being used to make high resolution liquid crystal displays. And this is just the first generation of it. So it is quite possible uh, in the next few years that this, the beginnings of this will start to pay off. And one of the reasons is that what would such a display be good for? If we wait for virtual reality to change the world, it may not happen. On the other hand, if we say it's the cheapest way to do a computer monitor, it's the cheapest way to do a home television because the cost of a home television is in the material, the packaging, and the fabrication, not in the electronics, not in the actual display. It is uh, a head-mounted display would be in just infinitely cheaper if you could build it. And so there's a lot of um, pressure operating here. And then the last one, which is the gotcha, which was I, when I mentioned this to the director of uh, Sharp Laboratories, his eyes lit up. And what I pointed out was the cheapest way to do high-definition television. And that, all of a sudden, we go back to that point that if you're interested in practical applications, entertainment, consumer applications are where the money is. And so uh, what we can imagine is uh, transmitting all of the information from a, a location, not just one camera view, but all views, compressing it, and it would f if you compress it, it would fit over a normal channel today. And then anybody in the country could be looking around with their head mounts in that, uh, in that space and they would get the same visual experience that they would get if they were sitting on the 50-yard line of a football game. And so Joe Sixpack may be the guy who gives us virtual reality. And this is, but the unfortunate thing has been to date, we have not been making the progress in the enabling technologies. We have greatly expanded the community, but we have not greatly expanded the achievement. And so there is reason to be concerned, even alarmed, uh, because if we continue not working on the problems, uh, we may find that this is yet another technology that we conceive, that we do the early invention, and then we watch others walk away with it. Thank you.
Welcome to the fifth hour of User Interface Strategies 94. We had to stop the lively discussion going on over here, but we'd like to uh, carry it on uh, with your comments and your questions. Uh, we have a set of faxes here. Please continue to send us your fax questions. We have some people on the line already, and we have questions waiting here. So we'll get to as much of it as we can. Uh, the first set of questions I want to handle uh, dealt with additional information that people wanted to have. Uh, Stuart Kay from the University of Manitoba uh, did want to know about interface information available through the Internet. Uh, and uh, we quickly brainstormed, racked our memories as best we could, and we've got on the overhead display uh, three sources that we want to recommend uh, strongly. I guess the place I'll put first and encourage you, a wonderful resource done by Gary Perlman uh, and hundreds of people collaborating over the net, a wonderful resource uh, called HCI Bib Bibliography. It's got at least 3,000 entries there, full text of the abstracts, and. Uh, um, and, and full information on journal articles, conference papers, and so on. You access this for free by sending mail to rumpus at ucolorado.edu, and you send a one-line message that says query, colon, space, and then you put several keywords. In about 10 or 15 minutes, you'll get back a dozen of the full text uh, items ranked by the latent semantic indexing methods developed at Belcor, uh, and this runs at University of Colorado. My students and all of you have better access to the literature through this method than I ever had as a researcher. And it's changed the way I teach, the way students do their work, and it just is a new world. It's one of those wonderful collaborations on the net that once it's done, it's available to everyone everywhere for free. Uh, the second is that I spend a lot of time reading SIGCHI, the ACM Special Interest Group in Computer Human Interaction still the fastest growing of all the special of the 35 special interest groups in the ACM has many different bulletin boards and discussion groups the one i think you want to be on is called announcements.chi uh, where you'll receive announcements of conferences books and other materials that are available you send an email where you write a message to, you send it to registrar.chi at xerox.com and you say please add me to the announcements.chi list uh, and, you know, if you want, to, I guess you can ask them for further information as right, a standard. Right. Uh, Jacob? Yeah, I think actually I should also mention on behalf of, of SIGCHI, where I'm one of the vice chairs, <laughs> we really thank Xerox for providing the service. Very to good. The community. <laughs> and thanks also to Jacob, who's pioneering the electronic publication for SIGCHI and working on methods to put up lots of information, uh, such as not just the abstracts, but full text of articles and other databases. Uh, the last one is Jacob's kind offer uh, for you to try a little electronic wizardry, a very simple and lightweight but lovely and very useful tool that uh, Jacob, um, I would say, pioneered or started. Called, you send any mail to Nielsen, make sure you spell it right, uh, dash info at belcor.com. You'll get back what he calls his business card, but it's a list of his publications and materials, and then you can inquire by continuing to send email to that source. So that'll get you started on some things on the network, uh, and there's uh, certainly there's bound to be other materials. Anybody have other suggestions here of resources such as that? Okay. Um, we did get a nice long fax from, let me thank Tom Hartrick uh, at IBM, um, and he, uh, from Cary, North Carolina, uh, encourages us to uh, with information about the book called Object Oriented Interface Design, uh, the IBM Common User Access Guidelines. It, it's a December 1992 publication that talks about their guidelines, and he particularly points me to the topic called Work Areas with Inside OS2, uh, which is, as he as is described here, a container used to group windows and objects to perform a task. And I gather he's suggesting that the one response to the method I, I mentioned, such as the rooms approach or the, the saving of uh, uh, the state of multiple windows. Uh, so that gets us some of the basic uh, informational uh, items. We have a series of specific <coughs> questions to uh, people on the panel here. But I, there were questions here in the room, and let me start uh, with uh, Oscar Garcia. I had a question to provoke a discussion amongst us here, Oscar. 
Yes, uh, you seem to have two different opinions with regard to the use of speech and audio uh -huh. in, the, in interfaces. I'd like to hear <laughs> the pros and cons. You'd like to hear it, huh? Not <laughs> read it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, this is a, a, a long and old discussion, and Myron alluded to that we agreed to disagree. He suggested that, and several of our uh, facts is also, uh, we talked around voice recognition capabilities. And Myron, I gather, alluded to the idea of pointing and talking at the same time, saying, you know, this is the one I mean, or having recognition. Now, uh, I've been an interested skeptic, I would say, of voice recognition. I think discrete word recognition with limited vocabularies, of, you know, have proven themselves to be useful, but for a limited set of applications, hands busy, eyes busy, mobility required, or harsh environments, I think those are... Uh, good situations where limited vocabulary works. The question is, are you going to be talking to your computer in a uh, office environment uh, in, a, in a common way? And I suggest that there will be applications for those. There will certainly be some applications on the telephone. But in general, I do not think the future will be rich with us talking to our computers. Voice store and forward, fine. But voice commands, I have some real problems. The problems are, first, uh, it's similar kind of verbal encumbrance in, a, in an office. If everybody's talking out loud at the same time, it's not for a lively uh, work environment. Uh, so there are problems there. Even if we solve the, the, the problem of rates of recognition, I think you could see the frustration with Apple Newton, even with pretty good recognition, uh, it was a frustration in dealing with, the, with the, the failures of recognition. But even if we overcome those recognition problems, which I think there will be continuing progress and better designs, uh, one of our studies, which was just published recently in the International Journal of Man-Machine Studies, did reveal a very important factor, which uh, you know it should have been noticed before. But you can't talk about one thing and think about something else at the same time. Um, in the studies we had done of voice recognition with uh, voice control of a word processor, just for the application Myron suggested, where you're pointing at a body of text somewhere, and then you have to go over somewhere else to select something from a menu, wouldn't it be nice to be typing and just say bold and turn that text into bold, or say new line and have it go? And there were 20 commands in this uh, with a head-mounted uh, microphone, which made it possible. And it did produce about 20% speed up in the performance of those tasks, replicating work such as Randy Pausch's and a similar in a Mac Draw application. However, when the task required complex cognitive load and short-term memory load, remembering something, scrolling down, and then typing, error rates went up dramatically. When we go to our psychologist friends, maybe Judy can comment, um, they say, oh, yes, sure, short-term memory is sometimes called auditory memory. So that when you are trying to remember something and then speak a command, you're more likely to lose it rather than to point at the command. Hand-eye coordination while talking is possible. Uh, you know, uh, those kind of things do overlap, but trying to remember things while talking is, is more of a problem. Okay? So there is a basic physiological interference which I think adds an extra impediment to voice recognition. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but I think it's an extra impediment. So I, I've cited those several reasons why I think we're not going to see as much voice recognition as Star Trek and Hollywood <laughs> would like to see, um, but I've I got to leave time for others. I might say in Star Trek it's extremely appealing from a, uh, from a, um, a playwright's point of view because by the uh, the actor speaking to the computer, you're of course telling the audience what's happening. So it's a perfect right. theatrical right. trick, right. but I don't okay. think it makes as much sense in common office or home environments. Okay, my pitch, Myron, I'll give you first, <laughs> and Judy, and then Jacob. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> I, I guess the um, the first thing, the 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 characteristic that you of um, tasks that you thought it was appropriate for, hands busy, eyes busy, I think will fit uh, describe quite well the new world in which the users of computers are people going about their everyday business with portable devices rather than uh, sitting at the desktop. Uh, another reason that is desirable is that the, the, limiting, the thing limiting the size of computers is the input and the output. 
And so a microphone can be actually very small. And uh, mm -hmm. it, that, that allows another set of possibilities. And there are uh, applications like for the remote col control on a television, which has just appeared. And I think that the, one of the things that held up the technology to date is that nobody was making any money. Uh, when people start deploying applications that make money, we go into a completely different mode. And so I expect that the performance will improve incrementally over time and, and that the, the recognition issues uh, are quite, um, I, I think those will be solely solved. Uh, I like very much the point you made about short-term memory because it, when you think about it, we need short-term memory primarily to understand speech where we have to look at back what, look back at what has been received so far to parse a sentence. So that, that is probably a fundamental uh, conflict. On the mm -hmm. other hand, we manage to operate in the real world talking to each other all the time. So I, I assume if I can talk to another person without getting confused, I can talk to a computer. As far as the distraction in the office place, if managers cared about distractions in the office place, <laughs> we would all have individual <laughs> soundproof <laughs> cubby holes. And in fact, the, the strategy of management seems on the contrary to, uh, to aggravate uh, our desire, you know, and any sense of concentration we might have. So I doubt that um, that speech will be kept out of the office for that reason. And I agree it will be distracting and disturbing. Uh, I think that also there will be the equivalent of, uh, there will be laryngitis, which will be the verbal <laughs> equi vocal equi equivalent <laughs> of uh, tunnel carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Judy? i just like to underscore uh, something that both Myron and, and uh, Ben said. We have eyes busy, hands busy, but we also then have brains busy. <laughs> tasks, right? And that since we do hear ourselves think, uh, I think there really might be a, a very significant trade-off. I don't have to say right leg forward, left leg forward, and chew gum and you know, do it all, all uh, uh, auditorily. Um, there really is going to be a trade-off here, what kind of task we need for mm -hmm. this kind of thing. Jacob, um, anything to add? Well, I should say from a telephone company perspective, there are a lot of good aspects about voice. That any phone in the world can be your user interface. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of the advantages. But from a usability perspective, though, I think I want to say that Voice input is just one more you know, input device, and it's just like typing in some sense. It's just another com uh, language. So it doesn't mm -hmm. remove the usability problem. I mean, because you can speak a command rather than type it, you still have to worry about what should that command be, what should the syntax be of the command. You know? So you don't, again, it's the back to the old, old peanut butter idea. <laughs> you don't you know, get a usable system just by pasting on some layer of stuff over another mm -hmm. over a bad design and I think that's really the key okay. issue it's just another interface in I, I will add one more way of looking at this question is if you're not doing voice what are you doing and for me the alternative is the highly visual interfaces and I would claim there's one or probably two orders of magnitude higher data rates through your eyes than through your ears and then you can take action as I showed in those dynamic queries and point to things very quickly, and as Myron showed with your hands shaping things, the data rate out of your hand, can you imagine trying to create that shape? You talked about a hundred times slower with a mouse, I would say a thousand <laughs> times slower with your voice, right. okay? And you know, that kind of three-dimensional or visual shaping with hands and pointing devices, I think is more likely to be yeah. the future. Well, it depends we on the task. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Actually, I just if figured you out. Want to do, if, you to, if you want to do a user interface for driving a car, okay, this is a classic example. Yeah. I think it's your example, even. Uh, so you don't want to say, you know, as you're driving, you know, left, right, fast, or slower, then it's much easier to use the, you know, the regular you know, direct manipulation devices you have in the car. But if you want to have a system for, to give direct directions. That's a good example of voice because you can have, you know, keep your eyes on the traffic and you can have a computer system that tells you turn right at the, at the next light. Also notice how referring to your, co your context, turn right at the next light, as opposed to written description that says turn right at the third light after the gas station or something like that. I'm going to let yeah. Jacob have the last <laughs> word there. Uh, I thank Don Cheney at JPL and John Tyler at IBM Boca Raton for pushing us along in that direction as well. Uh, I, we have a question out on telephone. Can we take one of those now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I see another question here. <laughs> uh, could you provide us some uh, guideline, guidelines uh, as to selecting existing applications for re-engineering, move them, move them uh, from uh, traditional uh, user interface to uh, graphic user interface? All right. Well, who wanted to <laughs> uh, 
I think really you need to worry worry about <coughs> several things. I mean, what is the cost of doing that conversion? Do you have systems with like thousands of old mainframe screens as certain people do have, and then it's really a big pain? Um, <coughs> And also, what are, what are the what's the potential for gain? I mean, again, we know some of the advantages of graphical user interfaces that they allow you to show more information, to integrate different sources of information. That's certainly one of the things that we're doing at the moment. We are really providing immense benefits to many of our our uh, you know users or employees by being able to integrate information that previously was in very different databases with inconsistent designs, causing them you know huge trouble and pain <coughs> to work with. So there's a huge potential for improving that application by moving it to a graphical interface. So there's a you know a big gain there. In many other cases there may not be that big a gain. I mean it's not necessarily true that graphical is always better, but there are many cases for which it is better. So that you know do that analysis of um, what is your potential for gain? I think that's I think that's that's probably the, the key point that I would I would recommend. Mm -hmm. Not just do, do it blind. I guess the question really becomes what do we mean by a graphical user interface? And I'm not so sure I'm ready to give that name graphical user interface to uh, <laughs> uh, current systems. I have much more high ambitions when I talk about let's say visual interfaces. Uh, to me, it's not very interesting when I have 20 icons on the screen as opposed to a scrolling list of 20 uh, text fields. Uh, what I want to see is a thousand fields of my hierarchy on the display at once, which we can do with the tree maps, or there are other competing strategies, such as cone trees and data spheres, which people have been proposing. Uh, and, and I'm sure there'll be other new ideas. And I think those visual displays, which put not just 20, but 2,000, two orders of magnitude, more information on the display are really where the future is. That's, that's very you know, powerful. Now, uh, that's the extreme question. The more short-term question, I would say, command line interfaces where users have to, as Jacob said, recall a command and type the command, as opposed to selecting from a list whereby there are no error messages and where they simply get it right or, you know, they select from it, is a very strong benefit, okay? Those particular techniques are advantageous. And the speed-ups are not just for novices. The evidence of about a dozen studies now show these graphic interfaces do have payoffs, and the payoffs are even greater for the experienced frequent users than for the novices. Sure, everybody can point to cases where the graphic interfaces have slowed them down because the current designs are pixel-based uh, on slower machines. It takes too long for a page to turn and to a file to open and for the, the text to reformat when you type some new materials there. And I think we need those faster processors to allow that to happen. Uh, a, an Emacs or WordPerfect user who's used to very rapid motion on a display and comes to something like a Mac or Windows interface where they can type faster than the screen can update uh, <laughs> is not happy. But once we get those updates to go faster, uh, there's lots of good reasons why pointing at objects rather than typing commands is a strong benefit. Well, I have a, anyone I have want a, to add? No, I want to ask a more specific question following on that one. Of Ben, you've got a lot of displays that are graphical, are spatial, not just GUIs yes. in general, but are spatial yes. layouts. And what have you found doesn't work in those spatial layouts? Well, I must say they can be confusing. Uh, and first-time users for some of these designs, such as the tree maps, do not always get it. We find it takes 10 or 15 minutes, so I'm not proposing them as a walk-up-and-use display. But once they spend a few mm -hmm. minutes on it and they see their own files, people send me these letters. Oh, I found 40 <laughs> megabytes that I could delete because it was duplicate. I didn't know it was there. Ah. They get a form of x-ray vision mm -hmm. into their mountains of data. Mm -hmm. they, have, they can see things a thousand times faster than they could before. They can browse and they get to see insights and understand patterns. But it's not yet trivial, and I don't suggest that our methods are the perfected ones yet. I think there's lots of room, and I want to encourage more people to do better than we've done uh, in these ways. But uh, as I said in a somewhat joking way, uh, well, I guess I'm no longer afraid of the flood is my response. I really feel we are getting to tools that allow you to manage those 100 email mm -hmm. messages you get a day and the 10,000 that you've got stored away right. in your files. It shouldn't be a problem to find the one that you want. And I think we're rapidly finding the technologies to support those uh, those browsing methods. Of course, the minute we have them, we will then overload them. That so is, that we of cannot. course. <laughs> <laughs> that is Parkinson's of course. law being the uh, only thing you can depend right. on. Discipline is <laughs> hard to acquire when you've got more megabytes, right? Uh, all right. Were there other questions immediately here? Then we have a, a fair number of questions for Jacob. In spite of Jacob's... <laughs> 
strong and clear defense filled with facts, numbers, and graphs about the uh, financial benefits of usability <laughs> engineering. We still have the challenges here, you know, phrased in very different ways uh, from uh, De Bruyne in, Mo in Montreal, uh, from, uh, let's see, I guess I don't have the name on there, but a number of, a number of people here uh, are still questioning uh, whether the benefits are really there. Maybe a way I could ask you to rephrase the question. What works when you go to a management and you say, we want to build a lab, or right, we want right. you to do usability testing as part of the next product cycle? How do you get the managers to sign up? Right. Money, time, and so on. Actually, the best method for that is to try to get that manager to use the system themselves. I mean, often they, they find they can't use the system or um, go and do a very, very, very simplistic user test and just videotape it, not without, without a lab, just by a regular, you know, home video, uh, and just show the immense difficulty people often have in using the software that this manager thought was, was good, but if, which in fact, if you don't have usability mm -hmm. engineering department, then it, there will always be so many usability problems in there that you can always find a lot of things to show. So that's just sort of more the intuitive argument rather mm -hmm. than the financial uh, argument. I, I would then call that one the, the low road approach. <laughs> sure. <laughs> the but threats if the you heart. don't do this. But that's in, fa that, that's in fact uh, works pretty well. Um, <laughs> then you have, but then you have, and then, then, then you have again the more financial arguments, but that differs so much between the different types of organizations. I mean, you have companies like ours where we're developing software essentially for in house use. Telephone companies pay to get the software developed and they use it themselves. Thus, any time we can improve the interface, that's a direct bottom line benefit. Okay. And the other one is, uh, you know, the, the shrink wrap software. In that case, mm -hmm. I think that reviews is a very good uh, argument, showing people, lo like some of the reviews that I showed in this, um, in, in my talk. But for the in-house use, we have much better, you know, solid data right. on it. Let me stay with that because that's the substance of one of these questions right. about the contrast or the relationship is asked between usability and productivity. That's right. And um, I mean, that's what you can truly measure, I mean, w which we really, we have done this many times. In fact, um, telephone companies are somewhat special in the world in having very detailed data on productivity. I mean, we can do it down to a tenth of a second for some people. And we know that, you know, if we can speed up uh, by only one second, the uh, directory assistance operator's handling of, you know, somebody calling up to get a number, uh, that'll save about, I think, about $1 million per year per region. Oh. We have seven I regions. Thought, well, I so thought there was a 1988 report uh, that said $40 million was w per year was the savings of one second for directory assistance call. Well, uh, there are different, also the different I'm types sure. of these directory <laughs> assistance <laughs> calls oh, also. Anyway. But, well, but in any case, I mean, the, the, the point, though, is um, that this is extremely well documented, right. um, how much is saved. So. And then you can, I mean, measure the the uh, the interfaces. So how much time does it in fact take people to perform this task on the old interface and the new interface? How much better is the new? Or actually, in one of our the studies that was done at Ninex, it was worse. You know, so they saved <laughs> they saved their money by not installing <laughs> something that they might otherwise yeah. have done and have lo they would have lost a lot of money by doing that. So um, it's really really w well documented. I, I guess I'd like to clarify the question by the list that you and I showed, which is usability is a general phrase. And the improvements to productivity may come from uh, those, those subcomponents. And it may help your discussion or your argument to management more clearly if you say, well, we have a problem because the learning time for our system, the course that people go to, mm -hmm. is four weeks long. And if we change the interface, we could drop that to one week. You can easily, I mean, okay. I would all, yeah, you can <laughs> easily do that, okay. actually. I would Your <laughs> argument may also be our productivity can be improved because one tenth of a second could be shaved on the average per transaction. Right, right. We have 10 million transactions on our airline reservation system <laughs> per day, and that mm. adds up. We could prove it by error rates. Some, some tasks are very highly error prone. And so if your management knows that, you know, you could save you know, drop from 10 errors per thousand commands down to six errors per thousand commands, that's a way to sell it as well. Uh, so I think you have to look more finely at the components of it and the low road approach of threats. If you don't, this will happen. <laughs> if you don't, our competitors will. And, the and they do, and they do. <laughs> that's right. It's happening. I think that's the, uh, that's the answer. That's one of the answers. Yeah. I think the other point is I, I like to say that, you know, would you go to a play where there were no rehearsals? 
Would you fly in a plane that hadn't been wind tunnel tested and had you know mock-ups and you know prototype tests? Of course not. And yet we expect user interfaces to be used this way. Uh, my experience and the other sort of suggested concern in some of these questions is, oh, usability testing is nice, but we don't have time in our schedule and we don't have the budget for it. I can't believe that kind of you know statement is still around. No. Uh, but uh, in, in the fact, point in fact, is yeah. the speed up, the speed up, not just, it saves time and saves money is my experience. You cited your figures, Claire Marie Carrad at IBM has this report which reports a hundred to one cost benefit from usability, money spent in usability testing. I find that extreme to present. I usually say about 10 to 1. And well, that's low. I mean, that's when you have a really failed project. I mean, 50, 50 to 1 or 100 to 1 are the normal numbers you get. Um, <laughs> I think people will not believe this. Well, I don't think and, people but will and believe and actually, but actually, that's only that's the user benefit. But we have an additional benefit in software development because you often find that a lot of the features that you might have planned that are in fact not needed because nobody uses them, and you can you know simplify the design. And by doing that, you actually s speed up on software development costs more than you have spent <coughs> on your usability costs. But that, of course, only works if you're doing the usability studies early in the life cycle. But um, that's one more thing that I have not included in my statistics is actually the software engineering benefits also from not having to modify the system at a later date. Because, mm -hmm. well, okay, one more of my motto yeah. is your system will be user tested. It's just a matter of do you do it in your own lab or do your customers <laughs> do it after you ship, okay? And if you have to make the changes to the software in the next release, it's about a hundred times more expensive than it is to make them at the stage mm. where the system is still in its prototype phase. Thus, uh, the software engineering savings from making the changes at the early stage as opposed to late stage are in fact many, many times bigger than the numbers I'm showing on my charts. But as you said, Ben, if I was going out to claim that we had a 400 to 1 savings, <laughs> then people might not believe me anymore. But that's, in fact, what you really have. I, I agree that it does happen. It's very hard to believe those kind of numbers, though. But I think we've all su we know we've suffered with systems that thousands or t millions of people may use, which are sort of I impeding our performance rather than speeding it up. And I'll right. emphasize, there, it is not that costly. I mean, there are the low-end <laughs> pieces that mm. are inexpensive and also uh, inexpensive in time. Right, just watching somebody mm -hmm. an afternoon has a great deal of payoff. Ab absolutely. So it doesn't have to. And impede maybe the, just the uh, other way for those who still have some concerns about it. You should realize about three years ago, a group was formed uh, called the Usability Professionals Association. Janice James at American Airlines was a key figure in that. And in three years now, it's grown to be more than 2,000 members and held its second conference last year at, uh, I guess, at Microsoft. Microsoft. And will the third one will be this coming summer. I don't think they've chosen the site yet. You can still be the site of that conference <laughs> if you wish. Right. Uh, but that is a very fast-growing uh, organization. So there are thousands of people who now are usability professionals. There are hundreds of usability labs around the country. And if you don't have one, you're missing something, right? That's right. All right, let me move on to an interesting question that bridges the gap between Jacob and Judy's question, uh, which comes from Intel uh, in Oregon. Is there a further discount in group heuristic evaluation? And the answer is no. Uh, um, no, the reason we don't do it in, in, in groups is to avoid this sort of groupthink phenomenon whereby people start you know, talking about along the same lines. The real major benefit from having multiple people do independent yeah, heuristic evaluations is that each person has a new perspective on the interface. Thus, by combining you know, the three to five, as I recommend, different evaluations, you gain much more. If you have a group of five people, well, you still certainly gain more than you if you have one person doing it. But you don't gain the same as if you have five independent people. What you can do, just the final point, what you can do is that first you have people do the independent evaluations and then you have them meet afterwards to a kind of debriefing meeting or analysis meeting, whatever you want to call it, where they exchange their list of problems. And further, then they will actually discover even more during the discussion. But another key thing there is, it is actually an educational opportunity because every person will have something that they did not find but somebody else found. And then by hearing about those usability problems, they learn more about usability. I'm glad you added that last point because right. I find that to be a very interesting right. method too. Right. There's well-known research about brainstorming in a group is not as good <coughs> as brainstorming by yourself and then adding all of those ideas. 
Unfortunately, nobody believes that when I tell them <laughs> because they love to brainstorm in a group because they get so surprised by these great ideas of other people. So, and yet they're not producing what they could have produced if they did it quietly by themselves first and then, as uh, Jacob said, put them together. It's well known. Right. Let me actually add one, one last point. It's a very interesting chapter uh, in my new book on usability inspection methods. No, no, the other, no, this book is also good, but I have another book coming out in April together with Bob Mack called Usability Inspection Methods. And one of the chapters in that book is in fact on exactly how to do this combination of first individual inspections and then group inspections by people from Hewlett Packard who have been doing that very successfully. The question prompted, uh, in my mind, one other interesting scenario, which is usability testing with pairs of people sitting at the terminal. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes that's an effective procedure uh, because you'll get two people working and they will talk to each other, and so they will explain to each other what's going on. And that process, if you capture it on video, may reveal some things that you wouldn't get if one person were sitting alone at, mm -hmm. uh, at a machine. Uh, so that's a sort of variant on this. That's two uh, users that's as right, opposed that's to right. two analysts. That's yes, right, right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Anything else on that? Okay. Real good. Let me uh, go on with question for Judy, which is the, uh, the dream question, is it, uh, <laughs> also from Intel. Is it possible for a single software system to support all types of conferencing? A single software system, system. A single software system support all types of conferences. That would be full of featureism then. Yes. I and mean, you'd never find what you want to do in the whole well, interface. I, but we're talking, you mean all the way from email all the way up to uh, I, shared documents? Uh, not, I guess not that's, soon. That's sort of the it's, fantasy it's, of putting everything together. I guess yeah. is one word processor possible to do everything? No, I guess it no. gets. I'm not sure. There will be specialized niches that things may be. Right, yeah. and I think we have a lot to learn about what you need when. Yeah. All right, some advice yeah. about that's a, that's not probably. always this. Yeah, I think it's probably too early to put together the Swiss Army knife of, uh, <laughs> of groupware. Army software. I mean, <laughs> for anything, it doesn't matter. I mean, for I think we've been doing anything. that a long time, yeah. actually. I mean, just in general, UK, you yeah. can't design the number one perfect system that does everything for everybody. Yeah. People always have specialized needs. I mean, some are novice users, some are experts. Some have do this, some do that. Mm -hmm. It's the same for hypertext. You know, my hypertext book, <laughs> I mentioned my third book. <laughs> you know, one of the th po real, ma real main points in that book is hypertext is many things. Because if, the, if you're doing, you know, reading technical documentation, you may need something like Superbook. You know, it's really good for finding your way around thousands of pages. Well, if you're doing, you know, a home entertainment mm. system, you would want to do something else. I mean, there are just so many different needs. Mm -hmm. You need different interfaces for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, for also for Judy, an interesting question from Montreal. Our friends at CRIM have uh, been regular viewers and participants here. Uh, ask a question about whether uh, the systems that support groupware uh, encourage or force almost collaboration through the medium of whatever tool they're using and discourage other means of group communication such as that is if people are doing a video conference do they then make less use of the telephone less use of face-to-face -face, or more how does it interact well, there is some uh, data collected about the, uh, once you've gotten video conferencing does do your travel budgets go down Right. When you have a video conference, it turns out that more people can interact at each end. <coughs> In the end, however, it turns out so far the travel budget does not go down, yeah. it goes up. Because it is not the original people who would have gotten together, but the fact that there are more people in each room that did not travel, you get specific experts getting together and say, we have to hash this out, etc. I suspect, however, that in the end, the travel budget will go down because there will be other ways, desktop sharing of the work itself as opposed to talking about the work that will actually make the second stage of that possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let me just add one more thing that we have found, um, whether people work in the same way after they have used some of these technologies. We had some um, uh, MBA students come in and use our group software where everybody can either uh, write on the whiteboard or um, use the uh, everybody at the same time technologies like aspects and then they go out and they want they go to the computer center and say well we want to do this down there and they don't support it you need to do it in this special facility well but then when they go to a room to discuss things now they all go to the whiteboard right they all get a pen because they know they can do a lot of work in parallel and move between it so it's actually the technologies changed the old technology mm -hmm. of ways of doing things because they suddenly realize mm -hmm. parallel input is, is appropriate and doable. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in a book uh, by Kiesler and Sproul um, called um, Connections, Connection. they talk about the analysis of these new technologies as sort of primary effects, which were maybe initially to try to lower mm -hmm. travel costs, and then secondary effects that may have been unanticipated. And I think that happens in a lot of these technologies <coughs> because they so dramatically change the way you do work. Uh, they're not simple little speed ups, but they really uh, are, are new ways of, of, of working and even thinking together. Uh, in, in teaching my this course this semester, which depended heavily on electronic mail and other tools for teamwork, students scattered around the country, the intensity of engagement among them and their just personal relationships that were formed were in, but judged by some of the students uh, to be more intense than face-to-face -face classes. Hmm. In that, in face-to-face -face classes, we call them face-to-face, -face, but it's really often the professor lecturing to the students who are all sitting there but not talking to each other very much and not having any team projects. But when these students were required to work intensely to accomplish demanding projects, they came to know each other, their life schedule, when their families were around, when their vacations were, what their preferences were, and they formed friendships and bonds and uh, that were uh, quite, uh, quite dramatic. And the same for me, the, the intensity of my participation in that class was unlike anything I've had. I mean, I really... Uh, I think there will be a secondary effect of that. He did a long distance learning where people had to work, <coughs> even themselves, uh, long distance working in subgroups. And some of the, uh, the uh, uh, intensity of that and the fact that they knew each other could be brought back into a classroom. If what we were doing is talking to you now and then gathering your responses, so you had to react right now to something, there'd be a higher degree of engagement. All right, some of these technologies, secondary effect is to take it back to how we used to do something and make even that better. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, let me move on for uh, Myron. Um, I, uh, your I'll strong back. words <laughs> and your, uh, were, uh, I, I found very intriguing and your, uh, your, how shall I say, your uh, complaints about some of the VR scenarios are, I, 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 I'm quite sympathetic to them. I think although we have a point of disagreement, you have to go to focus on that. We very much agree. And I, I, I've been sort of reporting this as sort of VR equals RV in that uh, virtual reality is a uh, recreational vehicle uh, as the best uh, uh, incantation of it. But I, I want to ask you, why do you think that, you know, in some circles anyway, the interest has so much con continued with the fascination with the goggles and gloves uh, scenario when uh, even Brenda Laurel in, in her uh, material called it a train wreck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a great picture, uh, and you know, for the for the media. And I think that people in the field don't ask themselves whether they really themselves personally would want to use it if they had it available. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. think that that uh, I think it's really useful if the person working on something has to use it or has a real need for it. Mm -hmm. and well, I, let, let me take a complaint to you, or let me take the opposition, which is you complained about the slow rates of display and the poor resolution, and I think even the most ardent defenders of VR would say, yes, you're right, but give us a chance. Those slow rates of update and the poor resolution are a manifestation of current systems. Isn't it going to be better a year from now? Oh, it'll be better, but we're a quarter of a century into this. So if you have any sense that technology, uh, and this is really, I give a talk called The Last American Idea, where I say, you know, it is interesting that only a quarter of a century into it does the National Science Foundation get interested. They're supposed <laughs> to lead. The re we, we have a habit of doing research after there's a constituency. <laughs> We're doing early research, putting it in this wine cellar and waiting for it to age, <laughs> and then, you know, pulling it out or, or complaining when... Uh, when, the Japanese, when the Japanese implement it as a consumer product or the French buy, uh, own VPL's patents. If we don't want it, uh, why, what's our complaint? And so the um, part of the, the issue is the, the priority of research. And the point is that the enabling technologies have really not moved. We, we've now gone from one early uh, mistake <laughs> Not a dishonest mistake in 1984, but certainly uh, it was the minute you could have done a head-mounted display with the, the viewfinder from a camcorder, and I th uh, mm -hmm. back in the uh, porta pack camera back mm -hmm. in the early 70s, and I would have done it if I'd had mm -hmm. $20,000. Mm -hmm. I never would have thought of hooking up wires. 
I mean, I would have... Hooking up wires? Well, a television set starts its life at ready to receive radio waves. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason that we have to have wires, a, a, a tether, in some uh -huh. cases, that uh, thick, yeah. going back from the person's head to the computer. I see. You would have kept uh, it independent. So, and that w resolution would have been similar to the early uh, mm -hmm. NASA devices. Yeah. But if you see that you have a technology, what we've had is a lot of people do research with devices which, quite frankly, it was clear from the outset they wouldn't be able to do anything with. And then to say, we have learned that we can't do anything with a, uh, the way I ask the question is at conferences, I'll say, does everybody know those little, can those little portable television sets that you can buy on Radio Shack? And then I ask, has anybody ever watched television on them? Yeah. Like for an hour. <laughs> All the hands go down. Yeah. No, but I don't, who ever bought one? But now I say that's the display you are going to make reality out of. Well, it's but, patent well, whoa, man, whoa. I mean, well, one of the questions that I'm spinning off of is Stephen Lee from Montreal at CRIM also, who who says that well, what about visual interfaces regarding laser uh, laser retinal scanning technology? Uh, does that technology hold the hope of having higher resolution or other ways? Oh, there are a. Um, a host of ways, and the thing is that if we had done just some work in the enabling technologies, anticipating where we were going rather than waiting until we were there, and and then starting research, uh, I mean, there's no, you know, the future is going to happen. That's pretty much sure, and and so the uh, we had the evidence that this was going to be possible. Mm -hmm. I mean, Moore's law predicted that where we were going to be and sure enough we're here mm -hmm. right. and and so it, it you didn't have to be a genius to see what was going to happen mm -hmm. and and yet we get here and we're all flat-footed and saying well w you know don't blame us that is well there is a research community and and the research community really uh, most of the research community is involved mm -hmm. because the press picked it up Mm -hmm. If it hadn't been for the hype, it would okay. not be a research topic. Let me just ask you to answer that question. Do you know the, anything about the laser, the, yeah. the laser retinal scanner? The laser retinal scanner is a, for those who uh, a, perfect, a good idea from uh, Tom Furness at the University of Washington, the HIT lab. And the idea is that the laser beam will scan into your eye directly, so you won't need optics. And uh, I think that that's, that's an interesting idea. It's a, it's a very difficult and complex thing. We could have started it years ago. Uh, and my own alternative is we've been able to integrate a million lasers on a chip for about three years. A telephone company has done that. And you know, it's not really immature, but I would do a, uh, a uh, contact lens mm -hmm. and I would fire those million lasers in parallel into the eye. So you have a 100% duty cycle because if the eye moves as the laser is scanning, you get a breakup in the image. And what the perceptual effect artifacts are of doing that, I don't know. All I know is in every display device, like there these field sequential that display the red image, the green image, the blue image now. And as my eye moves, I see the red image, the green image, and the blue image. But so Myron, talk it. about intrusive, invasive. <laughs> Health that's hazard. not just a contact lens. That's a contact <laughs> lens with a with a cord coming out no, of no, it. No, 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 no cord. It's all uh, all it's wireless. Oh, all wireless. Yeah. Optical enough? transmission. It, it, in other words, if it's chromatic. <laughs> no, I've been so, talking about this for a, a, a number of years, and a guy from GE Aerospace came uh -huh. up to me, Richard Economy, and he said, you know, uh, we've we've been looking at that, and we think we can build it. We can build right. it by the turn of the century. Well, I guess so, my, I, no, I just I think don't think that the, we have any uh, any examples of this. No one's built these things. Uh, we don't know how they're going to work. It is not something that's close to being uh, deployed. Well, right? but there's a general it, fact. And there's that an is, idea out well, there. Well, things that don't get worked on don't get done. Okay. And okay. so th that that's the basic issue. That if you saw, if you were doing a PERT chart, Mm -hmm. of virtual reality and you were planning for the future rather than waiting to see I've got a hundred le you know a thousand proposals in on this virtual reality I wonder what that is mm -hmm. uh, if we anticipated where it was going not really direct it but at least uh, do some of the enabling research uh, like the head tracking the walking around uh, portable wireless systems uh, contract some people to do it, have it ready so that when the, when you want to fund research that there you can let people use the best we can do rather than have them use stuff that's clearly inadequate and then uh, and then wait uh, while you s at the same time start 
working on the, on the technology itself. So okay. I, I think that technology is uh, is retrospective much of the time. I had a short one for you, for myself, before we go to some more mundane things. You talked about having uh, the football viewer being able to view from the 50-yard line and being able to turn around and see whichever direction they wanted. Well, why couldn't they put the view from the football itself, right? I mean, you could put it anywhere. <laughs> or the quarterback. Or, or the quarterback. Right, or, you know, <laughs> anywhere you'd want to. I think there's some interesting fantasies about, you know, In taking, the football, sure. Right, being choosing fresh perspectives. <laughs> well, or certainly on things. helmets, on the helmets of players. <laughs> yeah. In other words, B.O.J. Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> no All right. Uh, let me return to some other... Uh, topics, um, which uh, w one interesting direction that uh, uh, John Gersh of Johns Hopkins suggests we suggest that we've, we've focused on office work and places where the users can control the pace. And he's suggesting that what about process control systems where you're monitoring a reactor or some chemical plant, medical systems or military systems where things happen at a pace that you can't control and you have to respond in real time. How do you do usability testing in those environments? And I'm going to extend that to say, what does it mean, you know, group where in the environments of real-time collaboration and control rooms? So maybe ask Jacob. Um, first. I say mu much of it is exactly the same, and I've actually worked in some mm -hmm. of those systems. One of the differences, for example, is that. Uh, the meaning of the term catastrophic error can easily be different. <laughs> uh, <laughs> catastrophic error in, you know, uh, office system is that you lose a file. Uh, in the process system, it's like you burn down your cement plant or something <laughs> like that. You know, so so the issue Loss about user life. error. Yeah, I mean, user error is a more is more serious phenomenon in many of those systems. But there's no reason why you couldn't test them in exactly the same way and in fact that that's being done. I mean, much of the early work in fact in building things like usability labs, simulators and whatever was in fact done exactly in, uh, for those types of systems like nu nuclear control rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, one of, like, for instance, in Denmark, one of the true pioneers in this area was Jens Rasmussen who exactly worked on nuclear control room design. Mm -hmm. And so it's, much of it is the same. Okay. Okay. Uh, also, let me just add that we have in fact worked on systems like that also at Belcor where we have, you know, um, WFA dispatch out, whatever, which c is directing people who are driving around in trucks to repair equipment that's broken, and mo mo most of the same usability is just apply there. Um, there's a system for um, building, building uh, central office equipment, planning for what equipment should go where and what the uh, capacity should be of that equipment, and we in fact just converted that from character-based, or is in the process of converting that from character-based to graphical interface. And the goal of that project was to speed up usability by a factor of two, and they indeed measured it, and that's about what was achieved. I mean, okay. Judy? Well, usability tests of real-time group interactions are very difficult. Uh, part of it is just usability tests of a single individual and that person's equipment responding to other individuals. And what you have to do is have stooges right do these other unusual things and see how the person reacts to the individuals and to the group system <coughs> uh, and beyond that then you actually put real groups in there and see what happens but that's uh, less controlled and uh, often what you'll do is a beta test um, you know a side-by-side -side system so that people are training in the new system and then also um, mm -hmm. being a, reacting mm -hmm. in the real system. Yeah. A very difficult uh, work, very expensive. Uh, right, yeah. that's right. I, I think maybe a good example for... to those who follow, I'm quite impressed by the FAA's efforts in, in Atlantic City. They have a huge test facility where they test you know, new mm -hmm. radars, mm -hmm. but new procedures and new interfaces. Right. And they have dozens of people playing the role of airplane pilots yep. and making scenarios and also dealing with one of the sticky problems that rarely gets talked about is performance under stress. Yep. We tend to deal often with the first time user, the first hour of use, and Jacob suggested the difficulty of evaluating what happens after a week or a month of utilization, but still more difficult for me is the challenge, I think largely unexplored in the HCI community, of what happens in performance under stress, how do we design for people working under stress in nuclear reactors, uh, in medical systems, in military systems, because I believe the performance and reactions have to be very different, training has to be very different, and we know all too little about that topic. So I think there's lots of you know, directions to go uh, for, for interesting 
testing research, and that is one of them. Let me add one more thing about usability testing of office groupware is also very difficult because what you're doing often is changing the process, the whole business task that you are doing and what you're capable of. And therefore, it's not an hour test. You know, it's a month or six months because people adapt to a whole yep. new business process. Uh, often you should know where you're going in that business process and what you hope to achieve, but it's a mass learning yeah. exercise. I think That's we what's will, happening with Lotus right, Notes. The emergence uh, of this discipline will, I think, we'll see, uh, uh, you know, micro usability analyses like Jacob is talking about, but the idea of macro, macro. usability in terms of, uh, I alluded to the organizational structure, right. the social, if we change only the social structure, how does it affect performance with interactive systems, for example? Or if we change features right. in the interface, how does that change cohesion in an organization? How does it change the negotiations uh, among uh, competing groups, for example? Exactly. I think that's fascinating, very challenging work. I think that's some of the future of HCI, uh, if we can find funding for that. Uh, we had a couple of questions and discussions here in the hallway. Uh, this one, particularly well stated by Scott Kressler, Hewlett Packard at Cupertino, California who deals with the reconciliation of standards and innovation. Uh, an enduring problem. He says he's intrigued with the al our alpha sliders uh, and the other ideas with scroll bars, but I hesitate because they're non-standard. He has to implement them and so on. And then also uh, stepping toward these would be a step away from the benefits of consistent standard user interface. And here again, I think the mature, my, my response is that we have to deal with, he has a very good point, of course, exactly. if everybody goes off and is very, very innovative on basic products, uh, there will quickly be, you know, quite chaotic environments. Right, right. I think we're getting, I see a rather maturing field, and if we see the future maybe like automobiles, we see a rather stable interfaces in automobiles over period of time, but at the same time, each automobile company does have innovative projects that explore new technologies, try them out on novel test cars, and then migrate them in maybe on the high-end cars yeah. or a limited line, refines the problems in them, gets customer acceptance, understands the strengths and weaknesses, and then if it's proven in these increasingly exactly. broad trials, then you can talk about making them part of the base yeah. set the of The ones standards. that really work. But, but the key point is that you don't want every time you get a new window up, the scroll bar works differently. So it really is a trade-off. And I think one of, the, one of the key points is that you're trying out the, your new approaches, and then very selectively you bring some of them into your standard. I think it's a key point about doing interface standards to plan for the modification and the growth of those standards to encompass Thanks. new interface technologies. Mm -hmm. And Bruce Tognacini has a very good point about that, you know, in his chapter in uh, my fourth book uh, <laughs> on, uh, <laughs> on, on, user, all great, on, right? use, on user interface consistency. So, so, uh, so talk talks about how it's so important to have you know, users feel safe and confident that you keep the interface consistent, and at the same time, you allow for the modification and involvement of standards. So anytime you have a standard, also have a process in place for changing that standard. That's great. one of his key points. Great. It's interesting that you mention right. uh, cars as an example of consistency, since every time I get in a rental car, I practically have a wreck. <laughs> uh, well, that's you, so, Myron. <laughs> no, because they, they are constantly, uh -huh. uh, you know, doing little tricks with yeah. hiding uh, the, the different controls. I would say constantly is a strong word. Uh, I would I say I sometimes have problems, but I find them quite successful that I can sign up. We're about to run out of time here, so we'll have to hold questions. And uh, I just want to express my appreciation. This has been a particularly uh, <laughs> pleasant crew to work with, very co cooperative, and each produced a very pro professional uh, presentation. I learned a lot. I enjoyed myself, and I hope our viewers did as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation here and beyond. Good evening. Bye-bye.